Varis. Sorry, no, go. Varis. Or Varis. Or Varis. Or, yeah, another one of these names that it's not quite like Celtigar, Celtigar, but no one actually argues over this one. But Varis, that's who we're talking about today. It and varies. It's var- it varies. <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> An orphan owned by a mummer's troop and sold in turn to a man for use in a strange ritual that required making him into a eunuch. From there, he was left to die, but vowed to live. We'll ask how he wound up on the streets in the first place, if there isn't perhaps more to his ancestry than is apparent, because that might explain why he, of all these orphan children, was chosen for this. And that brings us to another central theme about Varys, something that we'll have to keep in mind throughout the entire episode. It's an example of why we should be questioning what he's told Tyrion and others about his youth. In other words, should we believe that story about the sorcerer? When we ask questions like, why wasn't it some other kid? Is that the wrong question? Are we falling for it like Tyrion did? Why isn't the question, is this story even true in the first place? Before we ask the question of why not some other kid, maybe we should be asking that question first. Both questions are valid, but let's not forget one uh, by getting caught up in the story and believing it at face value. I mean, Varys calls himself, indirectly, the most devious man in the Seven Kingdoms. And few readers would challenge that. Which means we'd be fools to believe he's telling Tyrion the absolute truth or the complete truth. And ditto goes for Illyrio, who also tells Tyrion quite a few things about himself and Varys and their shared history. And one of the few things we can trust about that part is that they've been working together for a long time. (laughs) And they probably know how to keep their stories straight because they've been working together for a long time and have been successful in their various endeavors. But by the same token... A dishonest person isn't always lying. Like, some of the things Varus has said are true. I mean, just because we're dubious about some of what he says doesn't mean we should discard it all. We should just take a closer look and see if we can figure out what might be suspect, what might be truth, and see what we can do with that. It's one of the things that makes Varus such a great character. The second most devious man in the Seven Kingdoms is Littlefinger, according to Varus. And he's a great character, too, but personally, I find Varys a lot more intriguing and unique of the two, and that's partly because we know what Littlefinger wants. A lot of it's gross, and a lot of it's kind of standard, like he wants power as much as he can get, right? That's kind of ordinary for, you know, fiction or real life. People want power, right? But Varys, like, what's he doing? What's his goal? Why? What's his motivation? He's not, like, after some girl like like, little, like Littlefinger was. He wasn't jilted as a youngster over, you know, some woman he was in love with. Like, that doesn't seem to be his motivation at all. We kind of have those answers for Littlefinger. But for Varys, it's like, what? What was it? You know, what What are these things? Still, like Littlefinger, like most people, he is very likely motivated and shaped by what happened to him as a child and as a teenager. Because that goes for everyone, right? Formative years. So we'll have some time for his early adulthood as well as that, but that comes with the caveat that the timeline's pretty loose here. We don't know how old he is, we don't know how old. there's a lot of dates that are kind of unsure. We have to kind of use ranges rather than specific dates, but that's all very useful. Sean, you have something to add? We might need another caveat. Almost everything we said about him, just not the story that uh, he told Tyrion or where he heard from Malaria or whatever, almost all of it needs to include ostensibly. Yes, yes. Because yeah. even basic things like having come from lists may or may not be true. Like, we don't yeah. really know for sure if that's even true. Or even if he did come from this, maybe he came from seven different places, but that's the one he singled out, the one he remembers best or whatever it is. So Yeah, you're totally right. It's everything has to be taken with a grain of salt because everything we know about Varus's youth comes from Varus. <laughs> Except for a few things that come from Illyrio, which really isn't any better. So, yeah. <laughs> so we won't be covering his time as the Master of Whispers for Ares, let alone during A Song of Ice and Fire when he considers himself the most devious man in the Seven Kingdoms. But we will discuss how he earned the skills that enabled him to move up to those lofty heights later in life. So we've got all that and more on this episode of History of Westeros podcast. Hello and welcome back, everybody. Another uh, great episode, I hope, we have for you today. A very fun character to discuss, one that you couldn't possibly, at least we couldn't possibly do in a single episode. Hence the uh, format that we started with the Neducation episode. This is along those same lines. Varus is a bit older than Ned, but the point being their early life was very interesting, very formative, and worth diving into. 
We are here almost every Sunday at 3 Eastern, streaming on YouTube. Afterwards, you can find an edited version of the video on Spotify or the audio-only episode version available anywhere you listen to podcasts. But if you listen on Patreon, it's ad-free. Sean, I see you have a nice House of the Dragon shirt on. I've got a Dunkin' Egg shirt today. And uh, Ashea, you've got some Spider-Verse. Nice. Oh, good for today. <laughs> yeah, I do. Yeah, you're right. I actually just wear, it's my Across the Spider-Verse like, sweatshirt that I love very much. But I didn't even consider that it is relevant for Varys the Spider, Sean. It did not, <laughs> not even occur to me. Varys I'm sad the Spider-Man. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> I almost, I was like a, a sliver away from buying a Spider-Man shirt at Disney World. I wish now I had gotten it. I would have worn it for the stream for sure. Uh, yeah, but we're the House of the Dragon one. I don't really have a good Varys appropriate shirt. Me neither. But yeah. <laughs> we've got some new word on House of the Dragon, so I thought that might add to the hype. I wish we were getting more word on Dunkin' Egg, though, I tell you. You know, it's funny. I have a Mazaria shirt and not a Varys shirt. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I have a Rohan Weber shirt, so I have, that's a spider no, on it. Yeah, yeah. a spider. You're right, yeah. Weber. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. I also don't have a Varys shirt. Well, interesting. <laughs> I'm trying to do research for this episode, I use a search in Ice and Fire to look for spider and all kinds of giant spiders in the north came up yeah and nice spider spiders. talk from uh duncan egg stories came up but yeah varus is plenty of, plenty of varus talk also so. varus is a, such a master of disguise that he's actually an ice spider in disguise yeah he's actually <laughs> just a secret ice spider you see our you secret targaryens he's a secret ice spider that's right I, I will tell you a lot of the spider talk that didn't necessarily apply to varus was pale spiders or Ooh, white spiders yeah. they did say that a lot and i said big as hounds <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> Mars is as big as a hound right <laughs> <laughs> he's kind of i'm joking too. but i am half wondering if martin was like planting some seed or creating some parallel same thing with the little birds because a bunch of you know sansa talk comes up with she gets little called little bird too. by by yeah. sandor yeah and she's like a child that's being manipulated that without realizing it even maybe is revealing secrets and so on. So I think there's Martin may not have done it intentionally, but he had to scratch his head, maybe even tried to not do it intentionally to keep that from happening. I bet. Absolutely. So yeah, so we've got a lot of fun stuff to talk about. Uh, Shout out to our friend Nina, of course, good queen alley with one L dot tumblr.com. Her latest blog post is relevant to her username, Good Queen Alice Ann. It's a discussion, a question she got on the proposed marriages for Jaehaerys before he eloped with <laughs> Good Queen Ally, who of course wasn't yet, uh, hadn't yet earned that nickname at the time. But there were a lot of kind of odd suggestions for marriages to Jaehaerys that s- imply some political shenanigans or hopefully uh, people hoping to pull off some shenanigans because they obviously didn't succeed in that. So it's a it's an interesting question and a very good answer. Check that out. Goodqueenalley.tumblr.com. If you have questions for us, you can ask them live. Ashea will often take note of them in the chat there and, and put them up for us. But you can also send them later to us at westeroshistory at gmail.com or just interact with us on our discord or in our facebook group on x on patreon any of the different ways we will see it and of course i'll mention some episodes at the end of this one that relate to this one as we often do our trivia question which will also give the answer at the end of the episode with dune on the brain for many of us and having just released our collab with alt shift x i thought i'd throw y'all a bit of a curveball which dune character do I refer to as the best parallel to Illyrio Mopatis? That, of course, usually I give the answer in the episode. This time I'm giving the answer in that episode. <laughs> so if you've listened to that one, you know the answer. Or you might yeah. be able to guess anyway. Yeah, if you're listening, if you've been watching us on YouTube, uh, we didn't have a live stream last week, but we released the podcast version of our Dune coverage with Alt-Shift-X. So you can hop over to our uh, our podcast, History of Westeros, and any service, and listen to that there. And there'll be a follow-up episode released. The first one is just spoiler-free, and the second one has spoilers for the second movie and a little bit beyond that. Uh, so that one will be released shortly. By the time a lot of you are hearing this, it will already be out. Mm-hmm. Throughout A Song of Ice and Fire, Varys has shown skill at mummery in many forms. Physical appearance, his odor, mannerisms, voices, everything that goes into a person. He's also extremely astute at reading people, learning their intentions and desires, and therefore their weaknesses. He has done so while concealing his own, 
He is a man who understands the value of secrets in terms that go far beyond wealth. It's part of what led him to such great heights in the first place. And rising from so little, allegedly, taught him the value of struggle in terms of character building, self-sufficiency, independence, seeing society from a variety of angles and different rungs on the ladder, the social ladder, experiencing aspects of life that most highborn that do not even come close to, don't even really acknowledge is, is a fact of life for a lot of people. So he's had a very different life than a lot of people who are at court, even if he's lying to us. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, he's seen it from different cultures too, right? Yes. Like there's not only a difference in like levels of uh, agency or whatever, when you talk about wealth and social strategies, but there's those differences will be even more different in a slave city versus, you know, even within Westeros, it can be different beyond the wall or, you yeah, know, very uh, true. in the high garden or Dorn and so on. So he, he maybe hasn't experienced all of those, but he's experienced more variety than more other people. So yes. could better understand those differences, even within Westeros. Especially most lords and ladies whom he operates around and deals with all time, all the time on a daily basis, et cetera. Those, those people who were born wealthy, born privileged, they have no idea what it's like other than maybe intellectually to these things. They certainly don't know how it feels. Now, it's shades of what Dunk said to Prince Makar at the end of The Hedge Knight. He said, you know, he's like, well, no, you should come be my squire, you know, and travel around, or not be my squire, travel around with me and take care of my, you know, be my son and all that and be at Summer Hall. And he's like, I think he'd learn more if we were out on the road, you know, sleeping in ditches. And he's like, he's a prince. How could she, he shouldn't do those things. He's like, I bet Arian never had never slept in a ditch, yeah. you know. I bet and, and Makar's like, mm. <laughs> all those other princes, and doing? he and yeah. he stalks off, but absolutely agrees because <laughs> the yeah. next day, Dunk uh, Egg shows up. He's like, I'm ready to go. Yeah, so this is same vibe there. Like Makar kind of understand got the point there, but it didn't occur to him until it was suggested. He's like, you know, that's a good point. You know, I'm not going to admit to it because I'm proud. Uh, but you're totally right, and this is this is the same thing that Varys was trying to impart to his claimant Aegon. Now, of course, Aegon isn't going to enter in this episode a whole lot because Aegon wasn't even born before Varys came to Westeros. So, uh, but we have to, there's parallels to Aegon with Varys himself among, uh, let alone other characters. So there is a lot of what we're going to have to look at his current situation in order to look back. And of course, that's what we have to do with all of this because all of Varys's youth is a matter of what we've been told. None of it we've seen. So looking at Varus's youth is a challenge because not only is it all just been told to us, we have so much reason to question it. There's so much context we have to take into account with his backstory and when he's telling these stories. That's a really big deal. Like when he tells Tyrion the story of how when he was cut, I think is really important. It's almost as important as the story itself because the first time Tyrion asks him, he, he's like, I'll tell you some other time. And then when he actually tells him, it's at a moment that's pretty pivotal. It's like before the Battle of the Blackwater, when a lot of things are kind of up in the air, and maybe there's a reason not to, tr like, Varys' loyalty should be questioned. So he goes on, goes on and talks about this. Anyway, we'll deal with that when we get to the ritual. But the point is, Tyrion's almost always the one that Varys is telling these stories to. Most of what we know about Varys' youth is specifically told to Tyrion, not just to other characters, to Tyrion. Right. Not not really other characters. Now, that's going to change probably in the long term. I expect Varus will have conversations with Danny and others, but that doesn't mean that he'll talk about his youth. It doesn't mean he'll talk about his background. He, he might. but uh, I don't know that we can count on it. Eddard's another one. He has conversations with Varus, but Varus's past does not come up in those. Eddard doesn't ask about his past. Varus doesn't volunteer information about his past. So it just doesn't come up. So, again, it's really just these Tyrion chapters are the meat of it. And that's something to take note of. It's worth pointing out that even if we have to distrust a lot of Varus says, I think there's an interesting irony that we also should, I think, trust a lot of what he says, most yeah. even of what he says. Tyrion himself points out, I think it was when, uh, oh, shoot, was it when Varus was testifying against him, maybe? Um, Tyrion points out that a truth mixed, a, a lie mixed with a half truth is better than a straight out lie. Because when there are parts of it that are true for sure, that people yeah. know and corroborate, and then the lie is mixed in with that, it's easier to accept the lie. When you just say something that's kind of out of nowhere or hard to believe, it's easier to dismiss as a lie. But when you mix it in with a bunch of other stuff that is true. And so 
Tyrion understands that. Varys has got to also understand that. Alario probably too. So he probably yep. mostly tells the truth. And every now and then slips some, something that's at least a little dishonest or incomplete. So as much as we want to throw shade in everything he says, I still feel like we probably should trust like 95% of it. Maybe. You know, when it comes down to it, you know. I, like, I feel like there's more. It's more likely he's left things out than has completely made things up. Um, but yeah. surely some things are made up, you know, and, and we'll try to do our best at maybe look flagging things that are more likely than others to be false. Like who else has left stuff out? Ned. Yeah, right? of course. But do we distrust everything he says? No. Because we know for sure there's certain things he left out, right? Yeah. He, and even when people try to be honest, they end up having biases and misremembering stuff. And, you know, they want to put their best foot forward. There's all these things that aren't unique to Varus. Yeah. That might make us mistrust some of it, but not all of it. Just yeah. like every other character. So. Well said. Yeah. So I do think we're going to get more on Varus eventually. I think George is definitely going to leave us in the dark about some things. That's just the nature of, of how he writes and how a lot of authors write. We're not going to get a full dossier on Varus' whole life by the end. But I definitely think we'll learn more than we have. And some of it might be to expose some of these lies. After all, Danny is the slayer of lies in her vision, and one of those lies is Prince Aegon, the cloth dragon on poles, supposedly, and and Varys and Illyrio are the ones holding those poles. So <laughs> the, the, he she probably won't only slay the lie that Aegon isn't Rhaegar's son, if that's in fact the case. There's other lies. Slayer, she's not slayer of lie. <laughs> she's slayer of lies. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so let's look at what we've been told so far. Consider the source. Consider the target, the listeners, the target audience of, of Varys' stories. And then we'll uh, question it <laughs> and, and, and review it and flip it over, turn it around, see how it looks. It's been a long tradition for us to point out when a character or place or thing appears for the first time in A Song of Ice and Fire, or Fire and Blood if that's the case, or World of Ice and Fire, Edge Knight, whatever. But that's not our focus today, since we're aiming at the version of Varys that does not appear in the text, since he's no spring chicken by Game of Thrones. However, that is immediately clear. In other words, the first mention of Varys includes Ned thinking that he's been the master of whispers since the time of Ares, meaning two decades or more. No spring chicken indeed, not even a winter chicken. He then first appears in Catelyn's fourth chapter, where we first learn he's a eunuch. But other than that, there's no more backstory. Just he's been Master Whispers for 20 plus years and he's a eunuch. And then she's thrown, Catelyn is, by the depth of his knowledge. And then by Littlefinger immediately blaming the dagger issue on Tyrion, which sort of takes over the narrative for the short term rather than Varys. So we can as well take a look at the first time George gave us information on his use. So here's... The first mention of Varys' backstory. Quote. The Lord Varys was born a slave in lease, did you know? Put not your trust in spiders, my lord. That was scarcely anything Ned needed to be told. There was something about Varys that made his flesh crawl. The context here is Pycelle openly suggesting to Ned that Varys was perhaps the one who poisoned John Aaron. He's like, Ned says... Uh, I've heard poison is a woman's weapon. He's like poison. He's like women. Uh, you know, something, lo, whatever. And eunuchs, you know, he's like eunuchs. Did you know Varus is a eunuch born in lease? He's like, yeah, everybody knows that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was Cravens. Women. Cravens. cravens that's and right. Yes, yeah. you're right. Cravens. That's the one I couldn't think of. <laughs> so as an aside, by the way, looking, this is not young Varus, but it might have been very satisfying for Varus to kill Pycelle. They were on, like, Pycelle was on the small council before Varys, and Varys has been there 20 years. How, like, Pycelle's just probably been openly insulting Varys for two straight decades, just, like, not concealing his disdain for the man. And Varys is like, finally, my plans allow me to murder this guy who's been a jerk to me for 20 plus years. Finally, I can get rid of this guy. And to women and crazy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Sansa, who he, like, abused. So he probably, lots of other people, and whoever else he did things to, um, they were like, yes, good job getting rid of that guy. But but think back, though. That's jumping way forward. We learned a lot more about Pycelle. At this point in the story, Pycelle looks like, doesn't look like a bad guy, because Ned look, thinks Varus is, his, makes his skin crawl. Catelyn makes Varus' his skin crawl. Pycelle's just joining in with that. <laughs> right? You He's. Said, you said Catelyn makes Varus' skin oh, oops. crawl. <laughs> Well, maybe he does. Maybe she does. No, obviously, I meant Varys makes Catelyn skin crawl. So both of them are uncomfortable with Varys. They think he's magical or dis suspicious or all of the above. Pycelle's just joining in with that. So at that point in the story, he's just, yeah, this doesn't mark him as, 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 as anything. He's just going along with the characters that we already trust. That kind of interesting the way that we're presented to him and presented with him in the first place. 
so that initially makes us more likely to believe what people say about him. When you're a villain and people are saying villainous things about you, we're more likely to believe that when someone like Ned and Catelyn, whom we trust, have the similar opinion, right? So it's already like we're already primed for this. But let's do the basic virus rundown before we get into too much into the into the weeds and the details. Let's just go through his early life, what we actually know. Kind of a rundown style here. <laughs> You know, like, a yeah, rundown? A rundown? Give me a rundown. What's yeah. a rundown, Aziz? Can you What's give What's a rundown? <laughs> <laughs> Can you give me an example of a Jim. rundown? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he was born into Liss into slavery, born in Liss into slavery, uh, apprenticed to a mummer's troop, which travels around. The master of the troop clearly owned him because that's who sold him, right? That, that makes, that all adds up. While the troop was in Mir, he's sold to this sorcerer who does this ritual and then leaves him for dead. But then he rises to... Which is an unofficial title, Prince of Thieves. That's not some, like, you've earned the right to be called. No, that's just a, a thing you call someone who's really good, at, like, among the best of thieves or whatever. Really good at it. I, I will say it is maybe a little bit more than that. Not just really good at it, but maybe a ringleader, too. Right? Absolutely, absolutely. But let's not get caught up in that. I'm just running through the yeah. details. We'll, we'll, we'll get more into that later. But you're right. That's yep. a good point. He's outed by some rival, and then slavers come after him. Which is a little odd. Like, why would slavers come after a thief? I guess it's because... The penalty for in a lot of these societies is enslavement. If you're like that's that's a criminal punishment that's fairly common. But it could be that he's an escaped slave and they wanted to they're slave catchers. That's another possibility. Um, but I'm not sure. Or he could be stealing from slavers. Perhaps that could be who he which, stole from. Yes. Which doesn't preclude the other issues either. He could be stealing for slavers who might want to get back at him, might want to make him a slave himself. Yeah, might, absolutely. So either way, he flees Mir and then goes to Pentos. And, and Pentos, there that's a good place to go if you're afraid of slavers, because as we know, as we've covered elsewhere, Bravos has lost several wars or beat Pentos in several wars and Pent and had imposed their anti slavery laws on them, which are loosely followed. They have they don't have they still have slaves, but it's not they're not called that. They're they have a, a lighter version of it. It's still basically slavery, but anyway. So he's there, it's a little safer for him there, and he meets Illyrio. And they begin their steal from other thieves and fence those goods business. Basically, organized crime mafia stuff. Then they move up to stealing secrets, which is also very organized crime mafia stuff. You use a, <laughs> steal bigger and better things. Steal more valuable things. And that's when he begins training his little birds to steal secrets super efficiently. And this is what leads to him and Illyrio growing so wealthy that they become respectable, which is also a thing that happens to mafioso. They, they, uh, they start using their illicit money to buy real businesses. And then they have a lot of real businesses that are, you know, above board. And then they can become respectable all of a sudden because they have all these legitimate businesses. And this is where, and of course, what counts as a legitimate business in Essos is there's a much lower bar there. <laughs> and it's a lot easier to be accepted as, as part of the, upper crust from pure wealth than it, you know, might be in, in other societies and times and places. Either way, this is what led to him getting hired by Ares, his skill at all that. And that's where he has been until very recently, obviously. Ostensibly what led to it. I, I suppose there was... It didn't happen randomly. I, I think Varus and Olario were angling for that. They, they wanted Ares to notice. Spreading rumor. Yeah. Yes. Witness yes. me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a funny thing to do for a guy who's so secretive, but you know, you gotta send do that just right. So, so let's go through that. Let's start with Lise and and work our way through all those details, that timeline, and see what we can pick at, what we can identify as perhaps suspect or as something that we probably believe. Now, Lise is. The story about him being born a slave in Lys does come from Pycelle. However, I, even though it's not corroborated, I tend to believe it. Or at least Pycelle didn't make it up. In other words, Virus probably told him that. And everybody else at court, like, where did you come from? You know, well, I came, I was born in Lys. Now, I don't have much reason to doubt that. Like, what difference does it make if he's from Volantis or Norvos or Slaver's Bay? It just doesn't matter. Unless maybe Tyrosh would matter, because that's the hotbed of Blackfire activity. But George hadn't worked all that out by the time he announced virus was from lease like that's in game of thrones that virus is from lease he hadn't george hadn't even written the term blackfire yet though he had fleshed out a lot of his backstory he hadn't given it all names and figured it all out so even that's not a great uh, pushback argument about his you know to, to, if we're trying to pin a lie on virus about his origin i don't know that this one's a good very fertile ground yeah i think it's something that like you said probably doesn't really matter where he's technically born like 
especially when you're young, when you're one, two, five, six years old, you don't really know where you are. You don't have control over it. It doesn't affect you that much, at least not as much as like your parents or the people directly raising you. So, I mean, obviously there can be some exceptions. I'd rather, there's definitely, I'd rather be born in, I don't know, uptown Manhattan than <laughs> war-torn Rwanda or something like that. But, uh, yeah. but whatever it is, wherever he was really born or whatever places he might've lived in his, in his, very young ages he's gonna pick the one true or not that will add most to his story or the story sure. he wants it to be does that make sense yeah i mean lease is a hotbed of, of slavery and and especially like brothel slaves and all that and that might be who he is he might have been a brothel the child of a brothel slave and that's a reasonable origin for him it makes a lot of sense or being a child of brothel slave might make it harder to track down who, who he really is if yes. someone wanted to look into it, right? Yeah, so. very good point. He's like, well, no one could possibly, but no one would even try to look up who he is if that's his origin. Like, well, you're never going to trace that. But that might be why he tells that story, so no one looks into it. Exactly. Very good point, Sean. Yeah, I like that. And so e even though, so it is a notable hotbed of Valyrian bloodlines. That's a point to remember. There's a lot of theories about his ancestry. And it's like, yeah, he might have some valyrian ancestry even incidentally even if it's not an important valyrian family like targaryen or blackfire it just might be because there's so much valyrian blood there it might be in him that doesn't necessarily make it relevant but it might so we'll we'll keep that in mind um he's been master of whispers for over 20 years like we said and I, he probably wasn't too too young when he was hired you know he, i doubt he was like 20 he probably his rise to power probably wasn't that quick but maybe he, but he was really good at it. It seems to be, he was talented. Maybe he was at least in his thirties. So I'm going to guess he's in his fifties, but maybe early, maybe late forties. Uh, it could be late fifties though. He's, he's, he's hard. It's hard to tell how old he is. Like when you shave your head and have no facial hair, it conceals your age a bit, right? You don't have any gray. You can't, if you have gray hair, you don't see it, you know? And, and it makes you like having smooth cheeks and a, it just makes you look a little younger. It might be a little Tim Foyley, but I don't put it beyond him to be even much older. Mm. Like if he's using some glamour like Melisandre or something like that. He tells us he's, he has his disdain for magic, but we have to kind of distrust stuff he tells us. So yeah. So and, and he also might disdain certain types of magic, but embrace others if it meets his end, you know. And for reasons I'll describe later, I think he's a little older than Illyrio. But may, maybe not. But I kind of based on a few things that, like I said, I'll get to that. Uh Illyrio calls himself old and fat. I mean, the second part's true. He's very overweight, but he he's pr old. What does that mean? You know, like a lot of people who would turn 30 say, oh, I feel so old. You know, it's like, well, what, you know, I, 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 yeah, I get <laughs> such an, children. <laughs> yeah, I get such an impression of Illyrio as the kind of dude who values youth and like looks back at his his lost youth. That's and a I, good point. I feel that he would feel old because he was so physically fit and spectacular Handsome, as a yeah. youth. So yeah, I wouldn't go so far as to say he's old by our standards or even necessarily a Westerosi standard. Yeah, he he yeah, you're right about that because he's he's there's a lot of evidence that he was a model or chosen to be yeah. a model when he was young. So <laughs> not not so much anymore. Now so that argues for being in their late forties ish, maybe early fifties, and uh, yeah, that's that's what we're working with. That's what we're operating on. I actually posted a poll in our Facebook group, and most of you seem to think late forties. That was the most popular choice. Not a hugely important thing, but I'm curious and wanted to think what you guys got or wanted to see what you guys think. And if that's accurate, late 40s, early 50s, he'd have been born in the mid 250s, which is an important time. And it supports a lot of the ancestry theories, which is that it's right before Summer Hall and the ensuing fifth Blackfire Rebellion. So he would have been a very young man when the final Blackfire champion uh, claimant was slain, being Melee's the Monstrous. And if he had any connection to that or relation to that, well, he would have taken the fall when, their, when that family fell apart. And that could be why he wound up in slavery. So it, it still, it's not proof of anything, but it fits. Like his age lines up with all that pretty well, being a young man in the era of the Black Fires finally being done. Uh, another theory out there is he's the descendant of Arian Brightflame. Again, another dunk and egg connection here. Aaron Brightflame was sent to Lys in exile after the Hedge Knight. Now, that was like 40 years before Varys was born, though. So he's not Varys' father. Probably not his grandfather. He's probably not his relation at all. But if he is, it would be like great-grandfather or something like that, or distant cousin. Unless my harebrained theory about Varys using some sort oh, of yeah. magic to True. his age. If he's a lot older <laughs> than he is. Yeah, you're right. Okay, yeah. <laughs> so Lys never comes up again. It 
never is mentioned again in association with Varus. Tyrion and Illyrio, when they talk about it, it doesn't come up at all. In fact, he's like, uh, he, you know, we, you know, he, he came to Mir, or he came to Pentos one from, she was like, he's like, yeah. Or, or no, he said, we were green boys in Pentos. He's like, I thought Varus came from Mir. He's like, yeah, he did. One step ahead of the slavers. Least does not come up. So uh, that's not necessarily me doubting it, but it's just pointing out how there's not much corroboration there. Again, I don't doubt it because of the whole, like, why it doesn't seem to be a reason to lie about it, but it's still, you know, we gotta be, we gotta keep it in mind. So he's a slave and an orphan. Which makes sense, right? If you're, if you have children and you're a slave, those children belong to the person that owns you. That's how these societies work. That's the inherent difference with thraldom is that your kids are not slaves in under the Ironborn system, which is like the only difference. A pretty important how difference. How noble of those Ironborn? How oh, yeah, noble how noble of them? Yes. English that. It's because <laughs> it's you know you're not a man if you only if you earn if you get child slaves through birth you have to capture them and and enslave them the <laughs> yeah. hard way. Like, yeah. <laughs> What? See, they they value hard work and <laughs> go get it. Yeah, <laughs> self uh, self actualizing there. So even if Pull we their kids up by the bootstraps. Yeah. So if he <laughs> so this this does add up to his his history being untraceable. If this is true, then yeah, he might not know who his parents are. Like if he was just taken away from his parents because he they were slaves and he's a slave, then yeah, then like the Unsullied, they don't know who their parents are. You know, uh, so there's a lot of things like that. His father could have been a noble who impregnated a household slave, something very common in Westeros without the slavery part. Uh, if Varys' mother was a brothel slave, we mentioned that. That's very common in Lease. Then his father could have just been some random John. Any client, you know, could have been a noble, could have been just some completely unknown person. They would have, definitely would have no way to trace that unless, like, this person had very specific features, <laughs> which Varys does not appear to have, unless his hair is silver. And he shaves that off, which is definitely possible. But but given that he's 50, if his hair came out silver, would you think that's silver or just gray? You know, so he's past the age where even that could be determined, even if we could see his hair, which we don't. So, And he's been shaving his head for a while, right? I yeah. don't think he just started doing it. when he, So he might have been trying to disguise silver hair when he was 20 or 25. I, guess, I mean, I guess we don't know for sure when he started shaving his head. I don't know. I didn't think of that until just now. Do we have a description of him from... No. When he was under Ares or whatever? Nope. Apparently he's always shaved his head. Now, it's not... Apparently, I think being a eunuch, you start losing your hair sooner. I think because of testosterone. I think that's true. I'm not... I, I'm not a, I, I, don't quote me on that. Double check that before you say that. So that may have been why he did it, just because he was losing his hair anyway. Like, I got to be suspicious of that, because I feel like men lose their hair more than women, and men have the testosterone, not women, so... Well, it's different for women. Yeah, it's... it's the whole yeah. mechanism is different, so... But you're right. Like, I, I'm out of pocket with my knowledge on how that works so anyway but it's also very relevant that while we're talking about lease illyrio claims to have met sarah his the love of his life at a lysine brothel mm, the same place Varus is from interesting so he claims sarah was the love of his life which is really sketchy it might be true but like this is illyrio like is he really following and falling in love with a random brothel worker and it cost him so much politically he said like this has always been a bit suspect not so suspect that we should dismiss it out of pocket but something we should question maybe sarah is a different has a different connection to them than they're willing to let on a family connection perhaps maybe it's Varus's cousin maybe Varus is like yeah my sister is enslaved as a brothel in a, in a brothel lease like i was or I was born into. So was she, but she's still there. I'm gone. You know, I became part of this troop and I had other skills, but she's still there. And and then they saved her. And they and saved Valerio her. And did feel a love for her. I don't know. Yeah. So I'm there's kind of impartial to that Lots idea. of permutations. Yeah. Like, I would say I'm partial to the idea that Varys and Sarah are related and had a... a a caring connection and and the connection with Illyrio kind of sprung from that connection is is what I lean towards at least. What you lean towards? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth noting not Tyrion doesn't call Shay the love of his life, but he makes a lot of risks for her. He takes a lot of chances and puts a lot of his I don't know reputation even life on the line for his relationship with her. So just because Illyrio is powerful or whatever doesn't mean he might not do the same for someone who. Again, Shea is, uh, I don't know, lowborn. You know, she's not some princess or something you might expect, you know, Ilario to 
or Tyrion to take such a chance for like Alario might have done with Saros. I agree. And I think the bottom line here, even if we can't get out the truth, is that it's it's difficult to see Sarah as a truly random discovery by Illyrio. That part of the story, I highly question. Whether Varys picked her, it doesn't have to be a family member. They don't have to be related, but that is a possibility. It would make a lot of sense. But it could just be like Illyrio later claims, I never knew why Varys picked me. Well, maybe this picked Sarah for a similar reason, the way they looked. Like if their whole thing is trying to produce a child that looks Targaryen, then you're going to look for someone that has a specific look, certain feature, certain eye color. And Sarah might have fit those, may have been the top of the list of the physical features they were looking for if they're trying to create a Targaryen looking child. And Illyrio has those looks. He's blonde and blue eyed. We do know what his hair color is and his eyes and that he was a good looking man when he was young. So that part fits really well. So it could just be the genetics that they wanted, but it could actually be certain noble ancestry on one or both sides, Illyrio or Varys or, and or Sarah. Um, of all three of them, I suspect Illyrio is the least likely to have noble yeah. ancestry. But and I'd say Sarah the most likely to me. Sarah the most likely, yes. And yeah, it's a lot more likely Varys and Sarah have, like certainly Sarah and Illyrio aren't related. That's, no. man, they're, they're really that's... trying to create big Targaryens. They're yeah. trying to be yeah, an incest. Don't be so sure. <laughs> yeah, maybe I shouldn't be so sure about that. But anyway, uh, we'll remind ourselves a few times in this episode, the plot to make or crown or both make and crown Aegon slash Young Griff may have been conceived prior to Varys' stint as Master Whispers. They may have planned this ahead of actually creating the child. It may have like took taken them years to find the right pairing of people to create this baby that looks Targaryen, you know? I don't know if that's even what they did, but let's keep in mind when Aegon was born. Now Tyrion looks at Aegon and thinks he's a little older than they say, but not a lot older. Like he might be 18 instead of 16 or 15, but that's not going to change our, our math on this like when they started conceiving this plan very much. And this is where Varys learned his mummer tricks at Lease. Uh, he was a apprentice to this mummer's troop, and he must have been pretty good at it. Like he he traveled with them. It's like if you're a kid playing soccer and you're chosen for the traveling team, you must be pretty good at soccer. Varus was a slave apprentice to a mummer's troop, and they took him on the road. They well on on the road. Like they were sailing to many different cities, according to him. Like Old Town, Lannisport, King's Landing, Bravos, just lots of places, and that implies a. a pretty decent length of time like traveling from old town to pentos takes a while and then he's names all these different cities they went to this all this time he's acquiring skills he's practicing he's learning mummer's tricks acting skills things that he uses now he must have had some like i said he must have had some talent must have had some ability might have worked really hard we see him hustle uh, a lot later so i kind of that kind of fits that he was useful to the mummer's troop which is an important point the fact that he was useful yet they sold him <laughs> so he is very good at the things that he must have learned back then so it all that all fits really well the whole mummery stuff so it's hard to imagine that a mummer's troop wasn't in his past given that he has so many mummer's skills that part really is hard to question you know i question the sarah stuff but this stuff yeah this this i kind of believe but beyond Lee, so what what happens is, right, he's one of the tour stops is Mir. And that's when his life took this dark and pivotal turn, allegedly. <laughs> so he doesn't have any, like, sense of Mir as, like, a home. It's just a place he got left and had to start over. So let's talk about the ritual. The first time Tyrion tries to get an answer... Regarding being made into a eunuch, Varys evades the question. Or maybe he doesn't, he doesn't maybe necessarily evade it, he, but he says, let's talk about it some other time. So may, maybe he was evading it. Either way, he's, he puts it off. And this is Tyrion, Clash of Kings 2, when this happens. This is, we're going to have the quote here. And this is just after he sent Jano Slint to the wall. Here we go. Who cut you, Varys? When and why? Who are you truly? The eunuch's smile never flickered but his eyes glittered with something that was not laughter. You are kind to ask, my lord, but my tale is long and sad, and we have treasons to discuss. Now, he could be acting here, but Tyrion, Tyrion certainly reads it as genuine emotion. I do, too. I mean, whatever you think of Varys and his deceptions, and whatever the real story is, which it might not be what we... There's no way that this wasn't, like, traumatic-ish. You know, I don't want to, like, 
overuse the word trauma, but this man was turned into a eunuch. I mean, that's pretty safe guess. It was horrible, even if there wasn't some dark ritual involved, even there, even if the voice and the sorcerer are completely made up. It's pretty awful no matter what, like, right? But Varus might have known that a story like this had a lot of potential to win him sympathy, to use as a way to win trust. Like, I'm going to get close to you. I'm going to share my personal secrets with you. We're going to trust each other a little more. And Varus could see that this would give him leverage over Tyrion, and he wants to use it at a specific time. And we know he's trying to recruit Tyrion, or trying to make an ally of him. We know that they have maybe a long-term plan of winning Tyrion over. So if he has clear goals of winning Tyrion over, then he's going to be very specific and use good timing with when he tells these personal stories to try to win Tyrion over. He's not going to just... He's, he's going to pick his moment. He's going to pick his spots when it has maximum effect. There's a lot of incentive here. If he's trying to win Tyrion over, and he's not going to scruple to tell, like, that's another reason to not believe, to think he's willing to lie. He's got goals here. He wants, he's got ambitions. We don't exactly know what the end game is, but we know he wants Tyrion. Or at some point he wanted Tyrion, and every, a lot of things that followed were his, in the effort to recruit him. And it might start, it might have started as far back as this. And so the timing of the telling of the ritual story is, is worth scrutiny. It's also noteworthy that he might not yet have decided how to tell the story to Tyrion. Yes. Like the, the core pieces of it that are true can still have different things added on depending on who he's talking to or what his goal is. So like pinning it on magic versus pinning it on slave owners versus, you know, whatever other thing, he might not quite have sized Tyrion up for which angle he's going to take when he tells the story. Yes. I like that. That's a very good point. Yeah, because it's, it's along the lines that I'm thinking. Like, when this next quote occurs, we're about to read here. Tyrion has just been told by Varys that of Renly's murder and the subsequent claiming of his army by Stannis. The mention of dark arts, the mention of a shadow baby. Well, it, uh, he didn't say shadow baby, but it was like some dark arts have been suspected here. And we uh, the rumors are that Sh Stannis has a shadow binder from a shy, which is true. <laughs> That's Melisandre. So... The mention of darker, you're right, Sean, he might have been waiting for a, a, a good hook to use. And Stannis, using dark arts, either fit perfectly or was a good lie to tell that Varys came up with in the interim. He's like, I need a good story. I'm going to work it up like an actor would. He's like, I need this monologue to be really effective. I need the audience to be bought in on this with my delivery has to be perfect. The details of the story have to be good. So, yeah. And here we go. Sean, Sean go ahead. Yeah. So just imagine if Stannis, instead of having Melisandre working for him, he'd have hired some mercenary troop from a slave city. Yeah. Imagine Varys him saying, might have uh, told this story a little differently. Yes. Right? So so check out this quote here and keep in mind just who Varys is and his skills, his acting and all that. Quote. This pause was longer than the one before. And when Varys spoke again, his voice was different somehow. I was an orphan boy apprenticed to a traveling folly. Our master owned a fat little cog, and we sailed up and down the narrow sea, performing in all the free cities, and from time to time, in Old Town and King's Landing. Different? Like, what does that mean? Because it's just a, it's a grave story, such a big part of his history? Uh, believable. But this is a guy who has such control over how he speaks. This is a trained actor. He knows these things. He's not going to do these things subconsciously. He's going to take on a voice in intentionally. He, for the gravity of what he's going to say. This is very performative, I think. Even if it's backed by truth, it's still he still wants it to hit a certain way. He wants it to land a certain way. So he can feed on his own real trauma to make it more believable, even though some of these details might not be. Again, so use Arya as an, as an example, too. Arya is a, actually quite a great parallel to Varys in so many ways, in ways that maybe a lot of y'all hadn't noticed. Some of you probably did notice the theater troupe stuff. That's a, that's a big one. Now, I assume he was a performer, but he might not have been. He might have been, you know, a stagehand. And some people do both. You know, there's jobs in theater that are, you know, multi-flexible. You do some makeup and costume stuff. Sometimes you perform. That's what Arya was going to do at the, at, the, uh, at her theater in, in Bravo. She was helping people with costumes, but she also had a scene. That's pretty normal for a, a stage uh, troupe. But he and he was good at it, right? That's an important, really important point. If he he was an apprenticed slave, so if he wasn't good at it, they would have just ditched him. They were like, "All right, you're not good at this. Find some other slave. Just 
turnover, right? But he must have been decent enough to keep his job. And again, this, this tracks with how good he is at mummery later in life. At first, it was probably a decent life, relatively speaking, for someone who's an enslaved orphan. You know, like most, you could, mostly you would expect to end up in hard labor or in a brothel or something just much worse than a traveling acting troupe. That's, that's much better than you would expect for, for an enslaved orphan. But of course, that was only temporary. It did take the dark turn. And here's that moment. Quote. One day at Mir... A certain man came to our folly. After the performance, he made an offer for me that my master found too tempting to refuse. I was in terror. I feared the man meant to use me as I had heard men used small boys. But in truth, the only part of me he had need of was my manhood. He gave me a potion that made me powerless to move or speak, yet did nothing to dull my senses. With a long, hooked blade, he sliced me, root and stem, chanting all the while. I watched him burn my manly parts on a brazier. The flames turned blue, and I heard a voice answer his call, though I did not understand the words they spoke. He says he was in terror, and you know, that's one, I, I certainly believe that. That's one of the most believable things he ever says. What a turn for a young person's life to take. This isn't even something you might imagine is possible. Like he said, he's worried about being sexually abused, which is terrifying enough, but then it's worse. So, uh, we wonder why, again, Illyrio says, I wonder why Varus chose him. We wonder why this random sorcerer guy chose Varus. Why was he chosen for this ritual out of all the other orphan boys? We're told young Varus was talented. We've seen evidence of it. It's corroborated in a number of ways. So why a, ta a relatively useful, talented slave boy that you choose him rather than some, I don't know, not very talented slave boy? It seems like that would be a better choice. Like it's kind of ugly to think about. But like if you're a slave owner, you're thinking of them as property. Why would you give a valuable one up when you could give one that doesn't have any skills if it's all the same? Like, what ritual requires talent amongst, like, is that really what we're meant to believe? Oh, I need someone who's good at mummery for this ritual. What? That isn't, like, what kind of magic is this? That doesn't really make much sense to me. I don't know. So you're selling a profitable asset to, like, he got an offer he couldn't refuse. The master paid was paid a lot by the sorcerer. But why? What did this sorcerer see in him that made him worth that? It's a very difficult part of the story to get past. Why scoop a boy from the gutter, teach him useful skills, see him succeed, then sell him to be maimed? It doesn't make a lot of sense unless there's a missing piece here. Besides the fact he was paid a lot, but even that. It's like, well, why did the sorcerer pay so much for Varys? Why, did, what, what, why wasn't some other boy useful? I mean, I'm sorry I didn't include some of these thoughts in her notes, but I, I've had other like sort of wait a minute pieces to this. Um, one is that how if the sorcerer just needed him to for this ritual, it seems like he could have had that and still given it back to the mummer's troop. What? Yeah. Why was there no discussion or negotiation? Right? Like, yeah. I, and. Well, and, I guess my also, question is, would Varys want to go back to the Mummer's Troop after they sold him? No, and, but he's a slave. They may not have yeah. a choice. They yeah. might sell him yeah. back, you know? And, <laughs> and on top of that, it's another piece of this this scenario that's a little weird. Why would the guy use a potion that keeps him alert, that lets him feel the pain? Like, wouldn't it be easier to just knock him out or use some other potion? It seems like a relatively weird, rare, unique sort of It just of makes it more awful. Of this. Yeah, it makes, the story, right. makes you feel more sympathy for Varys. Right. And so that makes me suspect this part of it. Yeah. That part I think he's making up that he probably wasn't really awake and aware of the pain, witnessed all this stuff. That's something that he gets to make up, mm -hmm. I, I think. Yeah. But I still don't know to what end or why the sorcerer would have done this in the first place. It, 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 it's a piece of this that I can make sense of what might be true or not true or why he would tell it this way. But it doesn't like solve the whole thing. It no, it doesn't. Yeah, confused. it really doesn't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, here let's let's move on with this more on this this aspect of it of his story. It's believable that Varys had qualities that made him right for this ritual, but it's hard to guess what that is if it's not something in his blood. And the only thing we know about in this world about blood is that there is power in king's blood, and even that's a suspect concept. But it's something believed by a lot of characters in world. So. This is perhaps the biggest suggestion that Varus was not some random orphan, but someone with notable ancestry. So 
obviously, if the whole question of King's blood is too big a topic for this episode, we'll just go on what we know about it. But this doesn't even add up with what we know about King's blood. Like, Melisandre just used leeches. Like, why wouldn't leeches work here? You no other blood juice. magic ritual. What's that? Need more juice. Need more it. juice. No other blood magic ritual we've ever seen involves castration. Like, this is the, a one-time thing. I'm where, like, oh, you know? Oh, Xerxes just, like, ran, did a weird thing. Sorry. Everything's good. Uh, I was going to say, I mean, I guess it would, what is the spell he's trying to do? Is it, like, a fertility spell? Like, it does, it, it, is it particularly relevant hmm. to what the sorcerer is trying to do? Like, maybe there's something to do with someone was infertile, was uh, impotent or something. And That's that. what the voice said. You are now fertile. Yeah, yeah. You, <laughs> you, some you can now get understand. hard. You can you get can, erections. You can now. I don't know. It's blue, like the color of Viagra. Yeah, yes, yeah I don't know. Like, I, honestly, but that is where I go with it. It's like if it's so like highly specific is about being that like a, a sexual organ, like that does the ritual Ooh. have a sexual uh, It's a sensible uh, to it. theory or at least like angle yeah. to take on it. I like that, yeah. And it did seem to be Melisandre's belief is it look at the magic I get from a little bit of blood out of these leeches. Uh, Think what I could do with an actual sacrifice. Okay. But yeah. maybe there's a lot of grades in between a little blood from a leech and sacrifice. Like maybe, and, and like Shay is saying, maybe you get even something more specific if you chop off their sword arm or chop off their ears or their tongue and the blood from that might give you different And we do have like, powers. we do have from Melisandre another red priest burning a whole person gives, does things. Now, the difference here is that this is so this is a part of a person, which sort of fits, but we've never seen this blue flame part before. No, never has the flame turned blue, which might be just like Varus could just be making things up that sound like magic. He's like, yeah, blue flames, uh, hooked blade, chanting. Yeah, just like stuff to make it sound believable. Uh, but it's still, it's not like you say, like a Shea's theory is pretty good. It's not far fetched. I mean, a lot of us are out here theorizing that Bran was fed Jojen. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> if that's possible, then why not this, right? Yeah, it's definitely possible. But there's a flaw in the ancestry theory, which I'm open to. I think there's a potential virus is maybe they maybe someone chopped his manhood off to keep him from making more black fires. I don't know. Like, it's possible. And yeah, it's... it wasn't a spell at all, but he was he, uh, he was made a eunuch. But yeah. Yeah, it might not have been for sorcery at all. I the, think that's a great point. That, exactly. The yeah. Unsullied are made into eunuchs very young in, in age. They they not saying virus was a former unsullied but there's lots of horrible things done to slaves that involve maiming and they don't they're not all sorcerers doing rituals <laughs> there's still a hole in that by the way if they just don't want to have kids just kill them they left them for dead anyway exactly Why not just stab them through the heart you know i so. agree with that that's usually what's done to potential claimants is you just kill them you don't just cast them. but that uh, but there are exceptions the byzantine empire would just cut the nose and would cut noses off of other claimants and blind them and wouldn't kill them it's like you're not a like no one's going to see you as a viable claimant to be emperor if you can't if you're blind and had your nose cut off. <laughs> they like were the wrong about part. that. The nose part is really like I know crazy it's just to, to make me. you horrible. Hor I know horrible it does work. At, like but... you're horrible looking, but like I'll, like as you say, there are exceptions. People were like, no, I, I still think this is a better claimant than <laughs> you. Noseless is still better than you, evil guy. <laughs> so. Uh, also, this is very minor, but I want to point out, noseless isn't just gross. It would affect your respiratory system, your ability, yeah. the body's ability to cool itself down. To, breathing germs and everything else your nose serves a, a bunch of functions it would yeah like i mean Tyrion is a good example he has issues with it a lot like it's always i mean he for him pretty much it's always just like scratching or and that's bad enough just constantly itching and being irritated yeah. and yeah but you're right it's worse than that so and here's another flaw with the sorcery idea even though the ancestor idea fits like how did the sorcerer know he's in the audience and he sees this kid he's like aha that's a secret targaryen like what <laughs> <laughs> How would he know? Like, how did he know? So, like, even this, how did he know, know that why... guy's special? Like, what did the sorcerer see in Varys, and how did he see it? How did he identify this quality, whatever it is? Well, my question is, well, does Varys know? Because if Varys knows, he could have been not so slick about it. He could have let it slip. That's true. Like, he could have, if his, if he's related to Sarah, Sarah knew and says, like, I don't know. Like, there's, if 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 he knows or his family knows, other people could easily find that out. And I also wonder how much of a sense a sorcerer type person could have for mm. that type of like late you could identify it yeah somehow you know, so I, I, do, means, yeah. I do feel that it, it has to be somewhat possible for him to identify yeah that kind of power but i think more likely is that varis knew his heritage mm. and 
it's someone else out. found out about it. Yeah. Yeah. That could, that would make some sense. I, I think, I do think that's a little more, even if we're it, not fully on board with his ancestry idea, that I kind of better, like I think, that. If I, that's the case. I kind of like that idea too, just because I like the idea of Varys like learning a lesson mm, in his life. That about he, he was a different type of personality. Sean's uh, nodding in agreement yeah. there. <laughs> well, not only in agreement there, but in agreement from a different angle too. It's possible that after this moment, he a wanted to learn who his ancestry was. Oh, like true. He, that, like it might have yeah. generated motivation for him to to track down secrets. It's something he got mm, really good at. That might have been another lesson learned. Find here, his right? own so, family. Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it, it's it's kind of in like in re, the inverse of Sir Glendon Ball, who's like, no, my dad was definitely Fireball, even though there's could have been any one of the men who visited that that particular brothel. Same thing here. He's like, Varys have, is, I think it was definitely Fireball. Yeah. And Varus is like, it could be as simple like, no, I don't want them to know who it really was. So I'll say it was a brothel. <laughs> uh, so let's continue, though. The story about the the night of the ritual like this is the climax of the story the the finishing move if it's a performance and it might be this is like the delivery the part that matters the most quote yet i still dream of that night my lord not of the sorcerer nor his blade nor even the way my manhood shriveled as it burned i dream of the voice the voice from the flames was it a god a demon some conjurer's trick i could not tell you and I know all the tricks. <laughs> all I can say for a certainty is that he called it and it answered. And since that day, I have hated magic and all those who practice it. If Lord Stannis is one such, I mean to see him dead. So if the story is true, and a, a, which a good question we just have to keep asking. This conjurer's trick is like, why? Who the hell is this guy tricking? Like, var your 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 victim? You're tricking him? Doesn't make much sense. So I don't think it's a conjurer's trick. It's just something that he's just acknowledging that I have no idea what happened, you know, because he knows Tyrion is skeptical, which is an interesting aspect of this. Tyrion is very skeptical about magic. So if Varys is trying to manipulate Tyrion into believing, hey, I'm definitely on your side. Stannis is, I would never ally with Stannis, even though Stannis is on his way with an army, even though Stannis is, is not unlikely to defeat you and kill you all. I'm still on your side, even though I've flipped sides before. I'm a guy that used to work for Ares, and then I switched to Robert, and now I'm Joffrey. Like, he's switched sides before. So he's he knows his loyalty will be called into question. He knows he's got to prove he's on their side. It's like Tywin being like, we killed all those Targaryens to, to make sure everyone knew what side we were on, because we didn't prove what side we were on earlier in the war. We had to be even more demonstrative about it later by murdering baby Targaryens to really send that message home same thing here he's like lord stannis he's 100 percent my enemy no matter what ideological differences i could never be on his side and, and he needs Tyrion to believe that he actually really needs cersei to believe that even more <laughs> which it will presumably though there may be some of those conversations happened off page or maybe he just expected that to get around and guess what happens during the battle of the, right before the battle of the blackwater Varys happens to expose the antler men a cons pro stannis conspiracy you know, that uh, that is a good way to prove he's definitely not on their side. <laughs> so, And do you think Varus just learned about them right then, right before nope. that? He's probably been <laughs> for quite a while. Let them simmer till the right moment. Yeah. That's exactly what I was implying there, Sean. Good catch. <laughs> yes, he was like, yeah, he, he knew about the antler men for a while, but he's, he he told at the moment that mattered most, I think, uh, or before it was too late. Yeah, the the maximum benefit to him. But still, and we should entertain this, though, the idea that this is true, like that ritual really happened or something like it really happened, which is crazy, right? It's wow. This is like, like I said, this is not a form of magic we've seen precisely else. We've seen maybe some similar things. Like we've heard weird voices from Miri Mazdor's tent. We've seen full body burning. So again, why not parts of a body? We've seen eunuchs made in a variety of other places, magical and non-magical. But communing with demonic entities? Not much of that in this world, right? We haven't seen much of that. It was demonic. It might have been angelic. It might have been angelic. or de <laughs> And now George says that, like, the gods aren't, like, beings you can talk to. So we can be pretty sure this is not a god or a deity. But it's it's a being of some kind. It talked, you know? And again, the flames turn blue, which, again, might just be embellishment. But it certainly makes it a little creepier, you know? And yeah, what the heck was that voice? If it was a real voice, if he really heard it, you know? And he says it gives him more nightmares than the sorcerer or the pain or, or any of that, which is like, whoa, 
which is big if true, but might not be. Might I be guess, just okay, embellishment I wanna, for effect. Roll call. I, I'm curious. Each of you, do you believe that Varys was cut by a sorcerer, A, and B, do you think it happened like that? I don't think he was cut by a sorcerer, but okay. he might have been. I, if, okay. if you're pinning me down on if I'm, I'm open to it. I'm pinning you down. I know. I mean, I, I'm fair I'll say less than 50-50 okay. that, that he was. I think I, I'm with you on that. I think it's less than 50-50 for me, too. As much as we are speculating on this, I don't know that I think that it was a sorcerer. If you had asked me before this episode, though, I, would, <laughs> I might have believed it. But oh, it was yeah. delving into this has been making me very suspicious. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a lot of holes in this, in this theory. Yeah, I think there's holes in him being castrated. Even as much as I like that it gives me evidence for him having targaryen blackfire heritage i like that aspect of it i think just him being castrated is enough for him to to have, to have proof of him having that heritage he doesn't yeah he, i don't know what about you sean pin you down i don't think so either i'm, okay. I'm highly suspicious yeah. of, of a lot of surrounding this like uh, i i don't even i you know i even I, literally tell you just started asking this question direct questions like do we even know for sure he's castrated? Do we even know for sure that that theory is, is out there? He does have yeah. the build of one, like he has the plumpness that the plumpness that we hear is, is, yeah. is associated with that. It's it's like a real world thing, and the and the hair thing. But he could just be leaning into it. I, I don't really go there. Like that would be kind of an easy. I don't. I don't go there either. But it is something that occurs it's a, to me. It's it a seems question like it's worth asking. Yeah. So it seems like something that someone could find out if they wanted or needed to, yes. and so he shouldn't lie about. It. Like things that can be found out for sure, he shouldn't lie about. I yeah, think he's yeah I think they're that, right, right there. So if anyone ever had a reason to see his, you know, his between his legs. Yeah, yeah. between his legs. <laughs> yeah. I, Even I if think, it's accidental, yeah. or maybe he shows some people to make sure it was. He gets known sick and that, and ends up like passed out, and and Pisa looks at check, him. Yeah, I yeah. Don't know. and the TV show he definitely is because what's her name like grabs him in the crotch and is and he goes, eh? mm. <laughs> but the yeah. show is not right. relevant here at all <laughs> in the show he also has the sorcerer shipped to him in a box which is like okay yeah. you know <laughs> that said i do have a question in the second half about did he ever track that guy down which he might have he, he learned all these secrets all this power he knows where the guy lived it again says he to put be me out clear of his, he says, took him to his house and did that stuff at his house I, to be clear when you say that guy that guy might have just, is the guy who castrated him who isn't necessarily a sorcerer to the extent or even a real person yeah or even a real person but yeah if he <laughs> It, someone castrated him and that's someone who could be tracked down and that someone might have even been had some sort of malign sorceress intent but i just think we're kind of agreed that it wasn't a ritual like we're seeing like, like he's describing yeah it might have been a, a ritual that did nothing like this is this guy's just like trying stuff and yeah. it's like yeah there was there was yeah. no voice <laughs> he just cut he cut my parts off burned them and nothing happened <laughs> you know uh it's not as good of a story here's <laughs> a couple other thoughts that whether it was a sorcerer or someone trying to track down black fire, secret black fires, whatever. Um, they might've, they, when they're trying to kill all Robert's bastards, do you think they might've killed a couple innocent kids on accident just to be sure? Just yes. grabbing whoever they think, Maybe. whatever they heard it's or whatever entirely story, possible. just when it yeah. fits. Yeah. So he might have been just someone on a mission to track down secret black fires and pick Varus out and was just wrong. Um, Still, it's a little weird that he would just not kill him. Why? Why pay money to get him, then castrate him, and not kill him? That those are like a weird series of. I guess events. so. You could still have him as a slave. So you could still be a laborer or whatever. Maybe he, like well, that seems petty. How did but, Varys but he get left away? him for yeah, dead. Yeah, he left him for uh, dead. Theoretically, right? maybe that's a lie. That yeah. part maybe might he didn't not be true. For dead. Maybe yeah. he took him as an apprentice and taught him all his black magic arts, <laughs> and that's how Paris <laughs> is hiding his age. You know, he, he's got a glamour on his crotch. That's why it looks like he's a eunuch, but he's not. It's actually there. He's actually really well hung. <laughs> He's actually a woman. And I'm, I'm, I'm a half joking, maybe more than half joking about some of this stuff, but it's worth noting that I think Ned and a couple other people say that he knows the black arts. That's like, how it's introduced. It, yeah. Catelyn's like, I swear he knows some black art. Yeah. Which and is, that might be all the more reason for Varys to separate himself from, no, I hate the black arts. Double whammy. Way, using black arts over here. Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he's a, he, I don't use black arts. I just use, you know, child I slavery. I, yeah, I think I like, I think like thematically as a story, in a story sense, I like the idea more of him as a, as a counterpart to our magic users and being like, no, you can still be despicable even if you're against magic. Like, you, you know, you don't, it requ doesn't require the supernatural for you to be an awful, awful person. And my, and my, taste when i look at it from like 
if I take a step back and look at all the characters and who's represented doing what, you know, I, I like him as a foil to a Melisandre type mm. thing, I guess. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, as I do. Yeah. Exactly about to say, Melisandre's willing to sacrifice children. Varys seems to be also. Yeah. yeah. So, which is, that's a great catch. And also, we have to think about this politically. Varys's goal, his long-term goal, is to elevate Aegon. So he's on one hand, he doesn't want to look like, doesn't want the Lannister to think he's going to switch to Stannis. But actually, he wants Aegon to win. And he doesn't want Aegon to fight Stannis. He wants Aegon to fight the Lannisters, who are a much easier target and much, they're hated. And not, and with, especially if Tywin's out of the way eventually, that's even more true. They didn't have good leadership once Tywin was gone. Stannis is, is hardcore, doesn't like Varys. Varys already knows that. Stannis won't work with Varys. He won't keep him on his council. So he's like, so there's a lot of reasons for Varys to not want Stannis to win. Uh, for his own goals and for his own, Stannis' own opinion of Varys. So this would put him, being against magic, though, if we could take that a little farther, this would not only put him in conflict with Stannis and Melisandre, but people like Makoro, uh, maybe even Danny. It might get complicated, his feelings on her, if he, you know, her for being the miracle worker who brings back dragons. I don't know. He, he hears that she's hatched dragons, but he doesn't necessarily know the, the magic behind all that. And she's not an active practitioner of black magic necessarily, but still, and, it's complicated. And I'm so curious about Varys' opinion on dragons. Yeah, dragons and and uh, yeah, so Jon Snow could be an issue. Like, if Jon Snow is secret Targaryen and that comes out, or if he's undead, like, what is that? What does Varys think about Walking Dead? What does Varys think about Bran, a freaking tree wizard? You know, what is that gonna do? Like, is Varys uh, on a head to head on a? collision course with being anti-Stark because of John Bran and Arya like Arya they're skin changers like these none of these things like seem to line up well with what Varys likes or his goals of course they definitely don't go with his goals of putting Aegon on the throne with Var with what with what Varys says he likes I right right there's always about that whether he's really against magic in the first good place, point but, yeah but the Starks might all present threats to his master yeah I, yes. yeah and I guess we're saying that he can not be a magic user, but also not be like violently against magic because of a traumatic experience. Mm. Like we're saying, there is a middle ground where he is spinning this as a way to get a sense of Tyrion and and cast uh, you know shade on Stannis, etc. As we mentioned, mm. but he might not actually hate magic. Yeah. Uh, one other point before our break here. I'm going to point out what a parallel. There's several parallels here. Arya and Varys have parallels with regarding their uh, youth and being cast away from their family and growing up in Essos, like as a, kind of taken in by some sketchy organization, <laughs> you know, that trains you in ways that are, you know, useful in other ways. Like they're both very good at mummery and things like that and uh, detached from their family, all that. And then with Danny, the whole being... Similar situation, chased throughout Essos with a target on your back and sold into slavery and, you know, pe being abused and, and all sorts of things like that. But Ned Stark as well, hiding a secret candidate that they're, but with the inverse, Ned's trying to keep John on the down low, doesn't want him to go for the throne. Whereas Varys is, probably has a false claimant that he does want to go for the throne. <laughs> uh, and the why of that is a part, something we'll... Uh, work on a bit in the second half of this episode all right so today i want to announce who won our episode poems poems our topics moot we called it on patreon we picked 12 topics over the course of the month of mostly february and there was lots of activity a lot of y'all participated it was i was very glad to see that lots of discussion lots of um just discussing about the polls and the different possibilities the topics and trying to decide which ones to pick out of all the choices that we pushed out there for y'all. So let me announce those, those 12 winners. Undead character poll, winner Cold Hands, that episode's already been made. Unfinished scripted series episode winner, Nymeria. We'll be finishing the Nymeria series. Yay. Robert's Rebellion Era poll was the winner was the abduction of Liana. We had a variety of historical influences and authorial influences. But y'all mostly picked the historical influences. The authorial influences were defeated. The Black Dinner won a runoff poll against J.R.R. Tolkien. The Black Dinner being the inspiration for the Red Wedding. 
Also, winners were Rome and A Song of Ice and Fire, Rome's influence on A Song of Ice and Fire, not just the TV show, meaning the mostly, you know, the Roman people and their republic and their empire, but also the TV show, because it was, actually, there is a bit of a connection there between the making of Game of Thrones and the making of the TV show Rome. And The Wars of the Roses, perhaps the most famous historical parallel to early A Song of Ice and Fire, not so much later A Song of Ice and Fire, although in some ways, yes, still. You mostly favored non-POV characters. For this episode, Varus, this episode was chosen by Topic Smoot. We wanted to see which other characters y'all wanted to see done in the young slash education of that we started with Ned. Y'all mostly favored older characters. Barristan almost won. Young Nan almost won. Maester Eamon did win, along with Varys and the oft-mentioned in this episode, Melisandre. So Melisandre will be, and Maester Eamon will both have young uh, version episodes later this year. And finally, the winners of the supernatural slash miscellaneous categories, The Missing. That'll be an episode on characters who have gone missing. People who we haven't seen in a while. Like, what happened to Captain Obvious? What happened to the Widow of the Waterfront? What happened to, there's a lot of characters that I don't have a list in front of me. You know, Stone, Snake, people like that. Next would be, what is the shadow? As in the Ashai by the shadow. What is it? Where'd it come from? What relevance might it have to forms of magic that we see in Westeros or might see in Westeros? Big, fun, supernatural, world-building mystery. And last but certainly not least, what happened to Hard Home? An episode all about Hard Home, where, where, how it was built and formed, and then what happened to it with its fiery doom sort of thing that happened. And as well, we'll have a follow-up on our discussion of volcanoes, which we started back when we discussed doom. We said we would follow up with Hardhome event episode eventually that also delved into some of the recent volcanic eruptions on Earth. So we'll have a little real world parallels there. Um, in particular, I'm thinking of the Tonga eruption, which was really incredible and devastating. But also with modern science, we we're able to track it in ways that previous earthquakes have not been able to be measured. So some interesting stuff there. So yes, folks, this is our pitch to you to sign up for our Patreon. We are always doing fun stuff over there, whether it's voting on topics, whether it's doing lots of them or a little of them, whether it's fun questions, whether or it's Discord whether hangouts. We have a trivia. Trivia, yeah. We have a, a song of ice and trivia, a song of ice and fire trivia coming up again this month for anyone who's a patron. We host it on Discord. And that'll be Tuesday, March 26th at 9 p.m. Eastern. But no matter what month you're listening to this, we have a monthly hangout, whether it's trivia or Jackbox games. This month again, March 26th for trivia and Tuesday, April 30th at 9 p.m. for Discord uh, Jackbox games. Right on. So, you know, come join the community, be part of voting, be part of hangouts, be part of you know, seeing episodes a little bit early when they're out on podcasts. There, there's many benefits we could uh, we could talk with you about. Over 20 bonus episodes, I believe, at this point. I don't have a count, but we have a lot of episodes that are not available on the main feed. So if you want more History of Westeros, as little as five bucks a month gets you a lot more episodes and more to come. Yeah. So patreon.com slash History of Westeros. That's where you go to get that done. Question from Cannibal the Dragon. Who do you think is part of Varys' family? I think he is the grandson of Bittersteel. You know, I used to entertain that idea too, but I once asked George R. R. Martin, straight up, did Bittersteel have any kids? He said no. So Bittersteel has no descendants, unfortunately. He could be... Was it a no or a no, I don't think he so. He said no, you're right. He said no, I don't think so. So he Just gave difference. himself an out in case he changed yeah. his mind, but for now, it's a no. Yeah, yeah. Uh, unfortunately, then. Anyway, so there, it's still possible he's connected to Blackfires or Targaryen's other way, but probably not directly through Bittersteel. And it's a good guess, though, because Bittersteel married one of Damon's daughters. So Damon ba Blackfire's daughter. So the, the idea that they could have had children is very, very much there, and they would have been Blackfire on both sides, in, in, a, in a sense. So Anthony De Palma asks, I wonder if Varys had another name when he was a slave, like how... Dancing Sean joined. I wonder if Varys had another name when he was a slave, like how Melisandre remembers being Melanie. Oh! A slave name yes Varys might be his own name like Grey Worm that's not his real name and yeah very good question yeah maybe that's not his real name hmm I have no idea what it would be but yeah it could be uh, some other name Aegon no I'm joking Aegon I'm joking. oh I'm god joking. <laughs> I'm totally joking it's Viserys John Rohel says is Varys an offspring of Damon Blackfire's sister I figure that's how the sword Blackfire ends up with Mopatis 
Well, we figure the sword ends up with him through other means, uh, if he even has it, which we do think he does. Certainly in a deleted scene version of an earlier chapter that George wrote, it seemed to be the indication it wasn't 100% confirmed, but it does seem to be what George intended. I think... He may have changed his mind, but... In my case, I don't know about you, I lean towards the theory that if there's a a Targaryen uh, heritage... I like the idea that it stems from Sarah Targaryen who went to Lys and then started a brothel in Volantis and did have sons mm. just because I like the the connection of, of the name Sarah. Like literally her name is Sarah, just Sarah. spelled differently. Yes. And like there's just a lot like like her sister's Visera, but spelled with, I don't know. There's a few things there. I'm a little bit partial to that. I know that there are some flaws and it makes them a Targaryen heritage, not a Blackfire heritage, but those Targaryens could have also married into some of the Blackfires there. Yeah, so absolutely. So it's not mutually exclusive by any means. So there's a couple of different ways the sword could have ended up with Illyrio, but there does have to be an explanation because the Targaryens would have recaptured it after the third Blackfire Rebellion when Hagon Blackfire surrendered. He lost and surrendered and was executed very dishonorably, but... You would think he had the sword when he was when that happened, and but but we lose track of it after that. We don't know how it went from there to there or not. Maybe it was stolen. That would make sense. Just being stolen is entirely possible. It's the safest guess probably at this point. But who knows? Who knows? Arya Saxena says it could be that the sorcerer knew Varys' parents and knew Varys when he was younger, so that it could solve the how does the sorcerer know he has real blood? Yeah, he could. Like freaking uh, several different. Free folk look at John and go, he looks like a Stark. <laughs> like, you know, so like certain families do have looks. Now, I don't know that Varys has the look. It's never been described to us that way. But maybe when he was younger, maybe when he had hair, maybe there were certain features, you know. Maybe he covers the look up. Yeah, maybe he does. You're right. Uh, so that's a good possibility. Yeah, maybe there was a, just, just some physical traits that made it look like that. Yeah, I, I'm down for that. So certainly you can't dismiss that possibility. Joe Magician says his obsession with secrets could stem from this, where letting his ancestry slip got him castrated, so made him more secretive. Absolutely. A mistake he'll never make again. And kind of like, oops, I'm, I, you normally don't get to make that mistake twice. Like, as we said, this would have more likely made him, we, we would guess he's more likely to be killed over this. Little did we but know. But it doesn't have to be the only case. Little did we know he actually did make the mistake twice. The first time they took the root and the second time the stem. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> That's so gruesome. <laughs> <laughs> Jesse Johnson says I'm a bit behind but I always believe Varus was taking the story of how unsullied are made to burn their own parts on a brazier also Illyrio surrounded by unsullied guards it's a good point They he does Grey Worm does sort of phrase it that way he's like the, the goddess that we worship the lady of battle the lady of spears or whatever they call her is like we don't even like telling giving, telling you her name she's a private thing that we worship only those who have burned their manhood on a brazier who sacrificed their manhood to the Brazier has can can worship her or whatever. It's like their secret goddess, basically. He's uncomfortable telling Danny, and he's not uncomfortable with anything about her being in charge, really. It's like the one thing that he's uncomfortable about. So Yeah, I mean, that is an interesting like if he's like okay, think of the movie The Usual Suspects, where Kevin Spacey's character, Kaiser Sose, is just taking details off the wall behind uh I forget Chaz Palminteri. Chaz Palminteri's character. He's like, oh, there's a there's a this name, and he's just using the details to to lie and make his story on the fly. So that could this is that's basically what Jesse is saying here is like the elements from what Varus has learned about Unix and Unsullied. Those elements are in this story, which is with the dark sorcery added in, but the brazier and the manhood being burned there, those are associated with the Unsullied. So yeah, yeah, good catch, good catch. Flip side, maybe the person who castrated him worships the same god. That's I don't know, at least a, another angle to take on that. April May says, well, the only other person who has eyes like Varus is Quaith. Dark, wet, and shiny. Varus and Quaith's eyes. I don't recall that description of Varus's eyes. Um, but if Varus is, has a glass candle and is speaking to Danny, well, that'd be interesting. Of course, we've seen Quaith like, on page right in front of Danny. She wasn't in a glass candle when she met her the first time, like standing there. But, uh, you know, there could be a quick connection. This certainly Quaith is... A giant mystery. So um, I'd have to verify that about the eyes. I don't remember that description. I don't remember any description of Varys' eyes, to be honest. Ashaya, do you think Varys has beady little spider eyes? <laughs> dark beast He's hiding his other eyes, six yeah. eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he does dark beast spider eyes. Nice deep cut <laughs> reference there, Sean. 
Very few people will get that. Lolotov <laughs> says, that's what I think of Shea, but I see him more as a foil to Bloodraven. The only person more powerful than him as far as knowing what's happening is an immortal tree man and Varus is just a human. Yes, Varus is a great parallel to Bloodraven. Here's why. On the surface, he says he's doing these things to save Westeros, to make a better world. That's what Bloodraven is doing. He's doing all this stuff, some of which is evil-ish, to save the world from the others. Which is kind of funny, because Varus is trying to save the world from something when there's actually a much bigger threat. <laughs> That's, that Bloodraven is attentive to, and Bran is attentive to, and other people are being focused on. So it is, But it does make for a parallel, where they're sort of on their own, doing a thing secretly that they think will make the world better, or that will save the world. And it involves doing kind of evil things to make that happen uh but it might be for good ends they both use disguises they both are scarred they both are yes pale they have yeah. <laughs> take many forms yeah <laughs> uh april may says in the mystery night the guy who tries to kill dunk uh when plum comes in wearing the glowing moonstone the guy who k dunk kills is described exactly like virus down to the powder yeah that's i mean that's blood raven uh, or alan cockshaw is the one that uh tries to kill Dunk, and then Bloodraven shows up and helps him in disguise as Maynard Plum. Yeah, I guess it, my point to April May, I would be curious to see the exact quotes for you that you feel is described exactly the same. As far as I can tell, Alan Cockshaw was plump, was pudgy, but I don't know that it was the description was, was exactly the same to me. I, I would have to check that. Hmm. Um, I don't know if you're worth a look. Easy. Yeah, maybe Varus like, is a cockshaw. <laughs> cockshaw. Yeah, like, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> be, I mean, that joke. is true. I mean, that could be the, the like. Yeah, he could have other noble. Uh, that would make him Westerosi, which is odd, but not out of. I mean, there's no reason to dismiss that. Yeah, no, no, exactly. There's no reason to completely dismiss that. So yeah, I would be curious to know more details on that. And then April May also says that the scene where. His eyes are described as dark, wet, and shiny as when Tyrion asks him how he was cut. Oh, so when he's so describing he's the ritual, his eyes look like that. Ooh. Too. Which what I take April. from that is that, you know, he's, he's, he's turning it on, maybe. That is very interesting. Okay, yeah. Well, maybe we're maybe I'll have to take a second look at that. Yes, that's, that's a very specific, odd description. Dark, wet, and shiny <laughs> for eyes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, we'll take a closer look at both of the at the talk shop uh, scene as well um, thanks for all the leisure. yeah thanks for all the comments y'all great questions this is such a great character as is evidenced by all the thoughts y'all have let's go back to what can i say fox oh, yeah. and bramble says he's he's not it's not a cock shaw it's cock shaw <laughs> <laughs> nice okay so this is well I, this next part i've called starting from nothing which is returning to virus's life in mirror but after the ritual quote the mummers had sailed by the time he was done with me. Once I had served his purpose, the man had no further interest in me, so he put me out. When I asked him what I should do now, he answered that he supposed I should die. To spite him, I resolved to live. I begged, I stole, and I sold what parts of my body still remained to me. Soon I was as good a thief as any in Mir, and when I was older, I learned that Often, the contents of a man's letters are more valuable than the contents of his purse. So the mummers had sailed by the time the sorcerer was done with him. That, I have questions about that, because what, did the sorcerer, like, wait for the moon to be right? It sounds like this all happened, like, right away. He took him home, did the ritual, and then cast him out. Like, a day or two? Obviously, there's, I can't be too sure of that. Uh, but it doesn't sound like it was a long process. So, uh, it's a little, little weird, but... Why would Varus want to go back anyway? <laughs> like you said, like, why would he want to go back to the troop that sold him to this guy? Maybe because he has nowhere else to go. He's completely hopeless, helpless. He has the only place he ever belonged. He has friends. Maybe some of the other people would care for him there. Yeah. It, he probably developed relationships with a bunch of the people there and enjoyed the work, even though the one guy in charge is a tyrant or whatever. You yeah. Know. So maybe it's just that he had no other choice. He's like, it's either that or be homeless on the streets, which is apparently what happened. So because he didn't have that option because the Mummer troop had sailed. So it's fairly believable, even though I have questions. Now, here's the thing. Here's the question to ask. Does it make the story better, worse, or is it just a matter of opinion? If he's a secret Targaryen or secret Blackfire, does that make is, is, is it is it too much of that to have too many characters with secret ancestry? Is it more interesting if he's truly a man that came from nearly nothing and is has the ability to change the world? Is that maybe more compelling? It, it, I, I bring up 
examples like Star Wars. Is it more interesting for Rey to be nobody or for her to be a Palpatine? I think there's a lot of division on that. Like, setting aside the other details of that movie, just that one de decision about who her family is. Like, it was cool when Luke was the son of Darth Vader. It's like, wow, that's really neat, you know? But you can overdo that. You keep going back to that what Sam well, you know? Right. Yeah. So I don't know that that's just the case here. I wonder if that's just one step too far. Like, yet another secret. But, of course... We don't know which ones are. There's so many theories of who is a secret target, who isn't. What if there, most of those aren't true or none of them are true and only this one is? You know, then it, maybe that wouldn't be so many. <laughs> it would still be another one more than John, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, a fake one in terms of Aegon, probably. But yeah, maybe that's just an overused like plot device of secret his history and heritage. You know, I just thought of something else. A reason why the Mummers might have sold him despite his skill and why they might have left without him. Maybe he was stealing from them. Yeah, Maybe he was okay. Maybe him and stealing from them too, and yeah. that was his punishment. Virus wouldn't tell that to Tyrion Wait, that, that he was trying to engender exactly. sympathy. He are you bring telling me that they foisted him? Foist. <laughs> they did a foist to Onto the sorcerer. Yeah, sorcerer <laughs> foisting. Yeah. So, the sorcerer foisted him on Westeros. <laughs> Maybe a small <laughs> Maybe a small issue. Maybe not an issue at all, but... Why did Varys not bleed out? Like, did the, the sorcerer not... Maybe it was cauterized. Maybe this blade was cauterized. That might make I, it easier to I thought to about that too, but it also doesn't make sense. If the sorcerer's leaving him for dead, why would, why would he bother tending to the wound? How well, did Varys it, live through this? It's a cauterized like, blade does answer that because it would, it would sear the wound as you're doing it. And it makes it easier to cut. Like, you see that in medieval sor surgery as you heat the blade up before before you... I suppose, yeah. Before you cut someone's arm off or before you amputate, you do heat the blade up to a super hot. So, uh, that... that I don't have too much of an issue with that, but it's, it's it's worth mentioning, worth questioning. Also, Varys didn't mention it, if that's what he did. He didn't he mention it. Super details hated. about the voice and a blue flame, but he didn't mention that part. He didn't mention the blade being hot. You're right. It's not it's not a detail he 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 mentioned. Totally true. So he says he begged, borrowed, stole, did sex work that he strongly implies was degrading, but also worth it because it got him to where he needed to be. And since he was a thief, I wouldn't be surprised if he stole from his uh, sex work clients. You know, <laughs> like, uh, and that's a key here. He makes it sound like. This, this being cut by the sorcerer, which might be made up. The being cut part probably isn't, but again, all these other details. He says this is like his biggest life motivation. The sorcerer telling him, I suppose you should die. To spite him, I chose to live. I, you know, to do all these things. He traces it all back to that moment. Pretty big. And this is what he's pushing on Tyrion as his reasoning. And it's like, man, this will get you a lot of sympathy. Tyrion understands. Tyrion understands being yeah. a cast out. Tyrion understands being not accepted by his family. Tyrion understands. Tyrion thinks of himself. As a bastard, all dwarves are bastard in their father's eyes, right? So this is this is like, yeah. I, how can I win Tyrion over without being too obvious? Yeah, and I think yeah, you're right. He knows his audience, and Tyrion is someone who would be motivated by spite, by being like, I'm gonna be the best, the best hand that I could ever be, to spite them all. I'll show them. And, and yeah, Showtime to show Cersei. Yeah, and, yeah. I think he knows. I, I, I think that they they would have that common ground between them. Yeah. But I kind of think I think it's not wrong that Varys might have someone he wants to spite. It might not. I don't think it's this scenario exactly, but someone somewhere might have told him you might as well die. Yeah. And he is actually has a. There might be a kernel of truth here. Yeah, there might be. There absolutely might be a kernel a kernel yeah. of truth here. And yeah, like someone being told, like being told you're utterly worthless, that you have no purpose in life could make, you know, give you a put a chip on your shoulder. And be like, oh, I'll show you. I'll show you what I can accomplish. You know, like that's that's like sort of negative motivation, but it certainly worked on Varus. You certainly like accomplished an awful lot. And the way he indicates it to Tyrion and Ned and Kevin is he's for the realm. He says to these all three of these people in different scenarios, very different circumstances that are happening when he says this. But he's like, yeah, I'm for the realm. I want to make peace. I want to make the realm good. Maybe it's even true. Like, this is something that we have to ask. Like, he comes from a horrible place. Maybe he wants to help create a world where that doesn't happen to people. Where this, like, people, children aren't treated that way. Let's treat t children terribly to make this world. He's treating it might yeah. really be the case. I, like, it's not, you're not wrong. But, yeah, he's like, well, let me, yeah. let me do this to 100 or 200 more kids and then it'll never happen to any children again. I mean, that's pretty naive, but... And questionable, but that might, it doesn't mean it's not his motivation. It, it's not unrealistic for someone to think that way. Now, here's an interesting point about him having been a sex worker. Shay sees through Varus's disguise. She, he comes up in like a mega disguise, and Shay's like, "Oh, there's Varus." And she, Tyrion's like, "What? That's Varus?" And Varus is even Varus is annoyed. He's like, "Damn it! How did you know?" <laughs> and she's like, "I'm a sex worker. You know, if I don't if I don't see through the disguise, I'm gonna end up dead." So, so Varus must have had a few of those skills, but not in the same way. 
because Varus isn't a young, pretty girl who's in a bigger risk, you know, probably, almost certainly. Uh, so I don't think that, I don't think being pretty applied to Varus. Although maybe, I don't know what he looked like when he was a kid. Maybe he was pretty. <laughs> so, I would guess he was pretty. <laughs> it's possible. I think so. So if you take a more rosy view, it's things like this. He's trying to end the treatment of people like this. It's, uh, and if you take a more grim, cynical view, it's he's willing to do really awful things just for his ambition, whatever that is, because we don't know what his ambition is. And if he's noble, if that theory is accurate, if he has noble ancestry, he feels for other noble children that were left behind, that were forced into an awful situation because of what happened to their parents. If Melis... Uh, the monstrous died and the Blackfire cause was ended, the Tairashi people who supported them would just quite possibly sell the rest of them into slavery. Like, oh, you guys are done. What am I going to do with these young Blackfires? They're worthless. I'll just sell them into slavery. We've got to get rid of them. We can't be seen associated with these people anymore. They're a, they're, a, they're, they're a toxic cause now. We can't be associated with this loss. We have to divest ourselves from this. So that would fit. You know, like you're you're... Part of a, you're a young person, part of a family that has its fall, you end up in a bad situation. You end up at, at the, you know, one step ahead of slavery. Like Danny, like Viserys, that's exactly what happened to them, right? Their family lost the Civil War, and they're on the run. That usurper's hired knives bit was exaggerated, but they were definitely hunted. I mean, there are definitely people after them. They definitely were at risk. <laughs> like Varus and Illyrio were part of the risk. <laughs> Taking them in and using them for their schemes, right? <laughs> so... Yeah, exactly. It's 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 unlikely. A lot of these things are individually unlikely, but somewhere in here is probably the truth. You know, <laughs> it's, it's just hard to so many different po permutations and possibilities. Now, all those different ways he he got himself out of the gutter, earning money. The criminal stuff was the most lucrative. The stuff that he could keep doing. He's not like, yeah, I'm gonna keep doing sex work. That's gonna make me rich. Yeah, obviously that's not his path to great wealth and power. But criminal stuff, absolutely. He had a lot of talent in that area. And he'd already acquired some skills that were useful through mummery. That's, that's really good. Think of how he is now. Very diplomatic. Very good at speaking to people. Very good at, like, putting their fears to rest. At not saying things that will inflame their anger. Good at, good at, uh, what's the term? Uh, De-escalating, you know, things like that. Just really good at that. Good at speaking. Good at talking, right? Charismatic in his own way, even though he turns people off, even though like people are afraid of him, he still manages to get through to them when they're like, "Ugh, Varus." But you know, <laughs> he's insightful. He's quick. He's very good at reading people. I imagine he was that when he young, just less refined. He had those same skills, but he just wasn't as uh, didn't have twenty years of practice at it. Didn't have uh, twenty years at court honing those skills. But maybe he was bolder. He had to take more risks when he was younger. You know, he needed to take more chances because he had less to work with he didn't have the crown's gold to hire spies with he had to use his own gold for that that he got through criminal stuff and in his rise what do you think about this sean we brought it up earlier before and shay i want to hear your take on this too did he get revenge on that sorcerer if the sorcerer's a real person or the person that cut him do you think he did i, I would guess he probably would have tried to find that guy if it if possible and maybe the dude was dead by the time he came of age to be able to do that but if he could track that guy down his ability to uh, to get secrets and to find people and to, he, there's few better. So if he wanted to go after that guy, I bet he did. What do y'all think? It, it seems like he's got the wherewithal to do it, right? If he decided to. And I imagine he would have, even if it was just like a curiosity, even if maybe some like burning revenge anger in his youth might have quelled over the years, I still think he would be curious. Um, although... That makes it even more hard to believe the story he told Tyrion because if he <laughs> did, it seems like he would know more about it or learn more about it or have a different take on it. So um, it may also be that he was curious and tried to find him and found out he was already dead or he was unfindable. That's or what I lean towards, I think. Just by the time mm. he was able to try to get his revenge and had the wherewithal to do that, Sorcerer was dead and gone. It's entirely possible. We're talking maybe 20 years later, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, that's, that's my think cuts to make i i like it as well because i like varis maybe not getting that like satisfaction or never seeing well i mean again like i, I say sorcerer but i really just mean man person who Dude. castrated yeah, him. person that did this um <laughs> but i man. think there's <laughs> some I, I like the idea i mean i don't like it but i, I find it meaningful that varis just never actually gets to 
get revenge on the person he mm-hmm. wants to get revenge on. Instead, he puts all of that energy and passion into changing the realm, etc. That could be it. That might be why he's so intent. He's never able to resolve this. 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 Un- yeah. I guess if we're comparing it to Varys and Arya again, it's interesting. The idea of like the unresolved revenge and and like it ne- never finding his real outlet, whereas Arya has actually managed to. <laughs> turn it around on people she wants to get revenge on and has her list and everything. You know what I mean? It's kind of yeah. the inverse of each other in that way. Yeah, that was my thought that maybe Varys failed at finding him or did find him or he's already dead or what it was, but this sort of like uh, drive, you're like, oh, well, now what? Now what do I do? And uh, yeah. you know, maybe compare that to the, what do you call it? Indigo Montoya. Uh, yeah, yeah. Finally killed the six finger man. Like, well, all right, now what do I do? Yeah, revenge. Um, yeah. What do you do after revenge? Yeah. I wanted to point out another th- factor with Varys too, that it, it, he doesn't seem particularly motivated by money. At least at this point, it's a little easier not to be motivated by money when you have it. And that's true. His quarters seem very meager. And maybe they, maybe he really doesn't even care about like, you know, finer things. But one reason people want money is security. And yes. he has security. And so and it and money helps a lot with that. So you're right about that. Let's move on to the third free city. We've done lease. We've done mirror. Now Pentos. Let's look at this discussion where Illyrio tells these details to Tyrion. Quote How is it that the spider became so clear sorry. How is it that the spider became so dear to you? We were young together, two green boys in Pentos. Varys came from Mir. So he did. I met him not long after he arrived, one step ahead of the slavers. By day, he slept in the sewers. By night, he prowled the rooftops like a cat. I was near as poor, a bravo in soiled silks, living by my blade. Perhaps you chanced to glimpse the statue by my pool? Pytho Malanon carved that when I was six and ten. A, a lovely thing, though now I weep to see it. So you might think that a poor 16-year-old having a statue carved after him is weird, but it's not. It's not, actually. There's there's a lot of real-world examples of just young people being selected for statue okay, modeling. Can I, can I say my impression art. of this, which is Illyrio slept around, too. Yeah, that's what maybe. I take he was a from hot this. Young teenager, yeah. I, yeah, I, I think <laughs> that's that's what that's what I take from this. That he was sought after, and I he would manage to to find some success this way. I don't know. That's entirely possible. Yeah, and he, yeah, I mean, it's think of model searches in rural areas. Yeah. I mean, that's it's yeah, not so strange yeah. at all. Like, you, young attractive person goes to moves to Hollywood mm-hmm. to make get their fame or whatever you know like it's something that it's similar to that you know yeah, that's, there, that's is, what I picture it, it really is I don't know if that's just me if I'm the only person I, I I can't imagine I'm alone that I just kind of filled in the blanks read between the lines yeah, and was like I, agree. I don't know I think I think Illyrio and Varys both use some amount of sex work to get ahead in life quite possibly ancient Greece has plenty of stories about young people as statue models you know Leonardo's David may have been one of those cases, if I remember correct, correctly. I could be crossing up my statue history. And I remember telling a story in a past episode where there was that really that statue of that famous courtesan in, I think, Thebes, maybe. It was definitely somewhere in Greece where the statue was so attractive that they had to put guards on it because people would try to have sex with it. <laughs> <laughs> some, some of y'all may remember that story from a pre- yeah. previous, previous episode. But yeah, so this Illyrio stuff isn't strange at all with that in mind. <laughs> I mean, people trying to bang <laughs> statues. Yeah, like. Mm. So by day, Varys slept in the sewers, according to the story. That sounds ugh, terrible. By night, he prowled the rooftops like a cat, which is kind of odd. What's he doing up there? <laughs> Sneaking in windows like that? It's loud. Walking on roofs like you're, you'll hear that, right? So you got to be really careful. So. Sneaking in windows? Is he going in chimneys? Is he Santa Varys? I don't, I don't quite get that, but he's just cleaning his paws. Yeah. He's just his paws like a cat. Picture him with whiskers. Does it work? You know, like Varys. <laughs> he doesn't. Have, he shaves all his hair, but not his whiskers. So, more seriously though, I assume this is like a vibe of a cat burglar. That's a modern, some semi-modern term, which is just a description of someone who's capable of robbing a place without leaving any trace that they'd ever been there. Which is absolutely Varys, and especially his little birds, little mice. 
Yeah, again, yeah, also, of course, makes you think of the connection of cats, birds, mice, yes. and we're different brought back to the Arya parallel. Different <laughs> quiet animals. Yes, yeah. cat, yeah. cat of the canals. Yep, again, are you, you're totally right, Shea. That is one of the Arya parallels. And yeah, so he called them little mice in Pentos and started calling them little birds later, which is, I don't know what to make of the name change there. It's Is it is it meant to... Is it meant to be like a little hint that this story has changed over time? That that maybe Illyrio got a detail, remembered it slightly wrong. Well, I, 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 I don't know. Like, maybe I'm reading too much. A connotation into it. between mice and birds. Like I wonder. Like one, the mice. Like, like he might have done more thievery and more. Like the the their purpose might have been different. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like the like they're more about telling tales and secrets. He's not really stealing around doing stuff yeah. like that. He's he's just getting he's purely just dealing in information at this point. Mm. And so he rebranded to reflect the information <laughs> it, sector. It it would sound nicer <laughs> to the nobles too. That Varys has this army of little mice. It's like, ugh, yeah. oh yeah. little birds. Oh, how sweet. And yeah. birds they already use ravens. Oh. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's a good yeah point. that might yeah. you're right. That might totally. be preferred vermin. Mice are vermins, birds aren't, you know. <laughs> anyway. Um I- Illyrio says in this quote that Varys arrived in Pentos from mere quote, one step ahead of the slavers. So keep that in mind for the next part of this quote. In Mir he was a prince of thieves until a rival thief informed on him. In Pentos, his accent marked him, and once he was known for a eunuch, he was despised and beaten. Why he chose me to protect him, I may never know, but we came to an arrangement. Vari spied on lesser thieves and took their takings. I offered my help to their victims, promising to recover their valuables for a fee. Soon, every man who had suffered a loss knew to come to me whilst city's footpads and cut purses sought out Varys, half to slit his throat, the other half to sell him what they'd stolen. We both grew rich, and richer still, when Varys trained his mice. So in Mere he was a prince of thieves, according to Illyrio, but he just told Tyrion they were two green boys living in Pentos. That is a little hard to square. Maybe Illyrio was green and Varys was not, which is why I guessed... Varys is older than Illyrio when I, at the beginning of the episode. This is the core of that argument. It's like, eh, maybe Illyrio was green, but Varys is like, he's got all this skill. A prince of, how are you a prince of thieves and a green boy? That, that does not work. I could, I could square that, I think. Okay, go I, ahead, go ahead. I, although on a Take surface, a it's definitely is suspicious. But one, I think he might call himself a prince of thieves, and that's an embellishment. Okay. It, it was just him and seven or eight kids from his neighborhood, and he was the best among that group. But among the entire population, he maybe was hardly known, but he would still be happy to call himself Prince of Thieves. And I mean, I think this is, and this is Illyrio's perspective on Varys. I think Illyrio had starry eyes for him, cared about Mm -hmm. him, and thought he was just so cool and so capable and all these things. To him, he was a Prince of Thieves. He came to him capable, successful. He He, he credits Varys with a lot of his success now. But to Varys, looking back, we were both green boys, ultimately. In uh, they, they learned so now. much after that yeah. point. Okay, yeah. yeah. Okay. He, yeah, he might and have put also, a little spin on it. He might have still been putting a little spin. <laughs> he could also be relatively green in a new town, right? Even if before he was a true Prince of Thieves, when you go to a new city, you lose your contacts. You don't know the roads or the sewers yeah. or the safe spots and the rooftops or whatever it is. So you kind of have to reset, and that makes you green. Relatively. Yeah, okay, that's a and very also, good point. He was green in Pentos. I'm also yeah. kind of curious about like are eunuchs not looked at, looked upon as 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 negatively in Mirror as Pentos? Was it no? Like it says, once he was known for a eunuch, he was despised and beaten. I wonder if he faced that same kind of ostracization did. in Mirror, or if. They were just, I don't know, I, I could see Pentos having a certain culture where they are maybe more uh, antagonistic to certain types of people. I, I, I don't be. know the cultural yeah. differences between them. I do imagine there are some differences between Pentos, Lys, and Mir culturally. It seems like pretty much everywhere they look down on eunuchs, but maybe less in some places than I others. Know. I could see that. Like, yeah, I could see it being a big problem in Pentos where it's only a small problem in Mir or whatever. Yeah. Um, it might have just never come out in Mir. No one ever knew. Like, look know. at how Pycel is. He's like a eunuch. Yeah. Or, you know, like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, red flag on this one, too, though. His accent marked him. This is one of the biggest holes in the story that, I, that I've that i seen. Maybe the biggest. This is a guy who's an expert at mummery. We've seen Varus change his voice, do different accents. Like, how the heck did his accent mark him? 
if he's already got his mummer strip experience, like maybe he didn't care to hide it. Maybe he didn't think it mattered. So maybe that's it. He was like we said, maybe he was a little more arrogant as a youth. Maybe that's what got him in trouble talking about his ancestry, something like that. And I have my, my question still. here, which is, again, how much is this colored by Illyrio's tale? He's the way mm. he puts this, why he chose me to protect him. I mean, like, did Vari see that the way to, like, cut through to Illyrio and make him yours, as it were, was he wanted to be a protector. He wanted to. Did Vari pretend to be weaker than he was in order to ensnare, to hook Illyrio to be his business partner? Mm. You know what I mean? And it makes sense. He would need protection. They say half, like, if you're stealing from other thieves. Yeah. yeah you need some and help. Do, but but if he wants, he wants reliable protection. He wants protection from someone that he can trust that. I don't know. I, I could see that he might have wanted Illyrio to perceive him a certain way in order to, to yeah. He might have wanted people in general to perceive him a certain way because if he marks himself with an accent, then when he changes an accent and his disguise, he won't be that same. It makes uh, it easier to disguise himself. When he makes sure he's known one way, then he can be different more easily. So Okay. that uh, I see that. Yeah, he wants to be seen as that guy that way. He's the, pe- he's the guy with the Mirish accent, so then they won't. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that does make some sense. Now, this is where we really get into the style of criminal organization that resembles what they're doing now. So stealing goods and reselling them, that's fencing. You know, not the sword fighting type, obviously. That's the, st- the selling of stolen goods is, is fencing. Obviously, um, or, nor is it, the, you know, putting a barrier around your yard. It's not that kind of fencing either. English is so confusing. Three different fencings and they're not at all related. Selling stolen goods. So th- thieves and mere learned over time, you know, through the through the thieve network, which, as you said, Sean, wouldn't they wouldn't know that about him in Pentos. So he had to start over. They if they don't sell their goods to Varus, <laughs> they risk them getting stolen. <laughs> I guess so it's even worse. It's like you better sell your stuff, your goods to Varus or you might get your stolen goods stolen. The twist here is that what's different about the fence in a real world fence, they just sell stolen goods to whoever. The twist is selling them back to their original owners. That's not typical. <laughs> That's the unusual part of this. Um, would they have had to keep their association hidden? Would Varus and Illyria not have to have association with each other? Like, that's the guy who stole it. You're selling me back. Like, people would find out that they're operating this. You stole from me. You're selling me back stuff that you stole. That wouldn't go well. But if they just, he's just this guy that has connections to the underworld and it's not a direct connection to Varus, that might work. But. I think they might have had to keep their association kind of hidden from for this aspect of their business to work. What do you think about that, Sean? At least eventually. Maybe they could have been sneaky about it at first. But then by the time it starts to be figured out, they're, they've got too much wealth and connection. People mm. just have to accept it, you know? Yeah. It reminds me of Omar from The Wire. If you've seen The Wire, you understand this reference. He was a stick-up boy, which is slang for someone who robs drug dealers. And why would you rob a drug dealer? Because they can't call the police. If you if they steal your heroin, how are you, you going to call? Hey, this guy stole my heroin. You know, like, what are you going to? Okay, so you're you're going to jail for the dealing heroin, right? Yeah, Yes, but get my drugs back for me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like you can't, there's no recourse. And, and in the real world, the way a lot of these criminal or drug dealing gangs work is they don't carry weapons because your, your penalty for getting caught with, a, with drugs and guns at the same time is double or more. But if you just have the drugs or just have the guns, your penalty is way less. So they tend to like these drug gangs split that job. You have one guy who's the enforcer who protects the, the guys holding the drugs or they hide the drugs somewhere where you, you know, they're not even it's not even physically on their person. Either way, there's no recourse other than violence to a, someone who steals from your criminal organization. So it's if virus steals from another thief, their only chance at justice is street justice right that's the only form and virus of course knows that he's got an organization he's probably that he says Illyrio protected him that was part of so Illyrio might have been a pretty good at fighting he says he was a, a bravo and living by his blade so that seems to be his trade was fighting this is very mafioso right they're stealing secrets they're selling they're extorting blackmail all the things that go into a mafia right they're mobsters. <laughs> that's what Virus and Illyrio were. Like, make no mistake. That's what they are slash were. Um, yeah. You know, that's the reason they might not have had to hide their relationship with each other. If, if Varus didn't do the actual stealing, if he just 
got the information about where the stuff was and had someone else do the stealing. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And, and, and if he's disguising his voice and his look, so maybe when he does do the stealing, it doesn't get recognized for it. Yeah. I wonder if he had a reputation for sorcery there. Like Catelyn and Ned are like, how the hell does he do this? It must be sorcery. I mean, I wonder if some people yeah. in Pentos that had, he had that reputation, which would make him more feared and more people like, yes, you better sell your stuff to Varys because you think you can hide it, but he's going to find it somehow. Like that dude might be using sorcery. So yeah. Yeah. Maybe he's actually using sorcery. Maybe he really is. It's, <laughs> I'm not big on that idea, but I won't dismiss it. I will not dismiss it. Let's talk about the little bird slash mice, because this is probably the worst. Probably. It's the worst thing he does that we know of. <laughs> Here's the quote. Wait, wait, wait. Can, before we do this, I, okay. I want to point out something else. Sure. Varus never makes a point of it. And maybe it's not a thing. But I realized that this process that they shifted from stealing stuff to stealing ideas. And I, I think there was even a, a line where they would even like he teaches the birds or whatever to to read something. He teaches them to read so they can read it and leave the letter there. He can still get the information. They don't even know that it was stolen or whatever. Yeah. And one, it's hard to est underestimate. It's hard to overestimate how valuable it can be to know like when a ship is coming into port or when the tax man is going to make the delivery of the, what he collected all different things like that could be hugely valuable, but they could also change the information. Ooh, they could, yeah. Like right? better call Saul, could, right? Changing yeah, the legal could, like, filing. <laughs> replace date <laughs> times or lie or spread false information, plant inaccurate letters or dates or things like that, which also can, lead to all sorts of value for you when you know the truth or know who you need to trick or when to make a guard leave his guard post because there's a false schedule posted that you made up or whatever. So his ability not only to get secrets, but to like disseminate information, true or false to whatever end it's he, it's something that he wouldn't want anyone to know about, True. but I think he would do and would be hugely valuable in a million different ways. So if those of you listening and not watching, I was nodding emphatically throughout basically <laughs> everything Sean just said. Yeah, I'm like, yes. Preach it, brother. I agree with all that. Uh, okay, so yeah, let's talk about little birds, little mice, and here's the quote for that. The older thieves were fools who thought no further than turning a night's plunder into wine. Varys preferred orphan boys and young girls. He chose the smallest, the ones who were quick and quiet, and taught them to climb walls and slip down chimneys. He taught them to read as well. We left the gold and gems for common thieves. Instead, our mice stole letters, ledgers, charts. Later, they would read them and leave them where they lay. Secrets are worth more than silver or sapphires, Varys claimed. Just so. You can see how this corroborates other things they're saying. He, he, first, he taught them to prowl the rooftops, climbing walls, sneaking in chimneys and windows, which is exactly what we, we suggested was happening. And at first, they stole the secrets, but eventually they just copied them. Like you said, Sean, the most sophisticated version of their operation where the people wouldn't even know the information. Because if you have a chart missing, you're like, oh, shoot, someone stole my secret chart that has my plans. They at least know to be worried about that. But in this latter scenario where they've, they've advanced to just stealing the information without actually stealing the paperwork, oof, you don't even know your information has been compromised. Think, like you said, you gave some good examples, Sean, of schedules and timing and things like that. But this this is corporate espionage in, on one level. Like you steal their trade secrets. Like, an equivalent in this world would be Valyrian steel or wildfire. How do, we don't know. Only the people who make those know how that's done. Now, I don't think Varus necessarily knows how to make wildfire or Valyrian steel, but it's an example of a proprietary secret that exists in that world. Most likely he made use of secrets that could destroy or embarrass powerful people or families rather than stealing trade secrets, like exposing that one business partner's cheating on the other or faking that, as you said, Sean. That's a great pivot, a great alternate idea rather than you can blackmail them to say, I'm going to make it look like you stole from your partner. And we all know your partner is the kind of guy that would kill you if you found out this. So give me some money <laughs> or, or you're screwed. Or like the part partner really is cheating and they're like, well, I'm going to prove, I'm going to show them proof that you cheated on them unless you, you know, give me some money or some more secrets, <laughs> maybe even better, more secrets. So uh, exposing an affair or parentage, right? Big deals. Like there's so many things that you could, and it's not hard to see why this made them powerful. And hated, just absolutely hated, but the kind of hated that you can't always do something about because he's got dirt on you. 
Yeah. Like, what are you going to yeah. do? Like, if you come at him and miss, if, another Omar reference, if you come at the king, you best not miss because his, his payback will be more than you can handle. <laughs> if you don't take him out, he's going to take you out. And that's, that's, that would be the fear of Varus, especially if they're worried he uses black magic. They're like, oh, crap. Like, I can't. I'm too afraid to go after him. He's got he's so powerful. He might be using sorcery. I'm not even going to do it. I'm just going to play along. He's got this army of little mice or little birds. He's got Ilario or whoever his bodyguards. Yeah. He seems to just have powers. You can't know things how, that you don't even know how we can understand. And Varus is also going to offer a carrot and a stick. Yes. Right? Yes. So, like, he just hits it from every angle. Yeah. And he doesn't have, like, notice in Westeros, he doesn't walk around with guards. He doesn't have people protecting him. It's part of his vibe. Like, I'm not threatening. You know, I'm not threatening. You know, like, um, anyone could just cut my head off. It's part of it's a tightrope. He's walking there. I'm not sure he walked such a narrow tightrope back in Pentos when his enemies were like more able to get at him. Like he lives at the Red Keep. That's it's hard to come at. You know, who's going to murder him in the Red Keep? There are answers to that question, but there's a lot fewer answers <laughs> than there would have yeah. been in Pentos. <laughs> in the streets of Pentos, yeah. Yeah. So he's not, and he's also not making enemies in the same way he did. Like he's not. He, he's still stealing secrets and stuff like that, but he's not like. He's not blackmailing and, and doing stuff like that and extorting nearly as much. It doesn't seem like in, in Westeros. He's more about identifying treason and identifying He's things gaining like that. allies, if anything, yes. right? Like, yeah. That, yeah, it's kind of a pivot. He's more like, this makes me, people want me on their side. Like, I want to be valuable for what I know rather than hated for what I know. <laughs> what I Even people that don't like the type of thing he's doing still recognizes his, recognize his value. Yeah. Even Cersei Ned or Littlefinger that don't trust yeah. him, they still go to him. They yes. still listen to him. Yeah. Good point. So as awful as the story of what was done to him is, of being cut, of being a slave, being orphaned, all those things, it seems he's done the same to these children, these, these, sla these, uh, these uh, little birds. He cuts their tongues out. He uh, teaches them a secret language. He presumably disposes of them or has them just work at Illyrio's house when they're too old and large to sink down chimneys anymore. Um, a lot of effort goes into it, not to praise him, but it's got to be hard to teach children all these skills or teach anyone all these skills. It's a very advanced training. This is like CIA training, but horrifying. Um, and just to learn all these skills that you don't shouldn't teach children i mean it's awful but so yeah if you ever find yourself thinking virus is a good guy just remember this and question that you know like well i don't know i don't know about that maybe he does have a noble end goal but there is no way around this as an evil thing i try to like justify him i try to like well maybe he's finding kids who are already starving destitute orphans and giving them some other option and Having her tongue cut out, their 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 tongue cut out, <laughs> <laughs> their tongue cut out is better than starving on the streets or whatever else might come of them. But it's it's pretty questionable, <laughs> right? Like maybe he's finding you know the lesser two evils, but that's not true either because he could just feed them. He's he got money. Them home, yeah. He can, you know he has <laughs> enough powers and secrets and wealth that he could provide better for them rather than take advantage of them. Even if he's raising them up from a worse situation. He's still raising them into a bad situation when he could raise them into a good situation. Yeah. And even if it is for an ostensibly long-term greater good, we don't see that. And it's hard to think how great the good could be to justify what he's doing. And and that's also with me trying to get him benefit of it out. Like, so like yeah. it, he might not even deserve that. So good point. It's rough. It's, it's like, I don't know. And again, not to justify him, but, Recruiting kids in your army is not that much better, right? right like, yeah. here, take this sword and shield and go kill other people. It isn't that much better than take this, you know, skeleton key and break into this house and steal this stuff. I guess yeah. you have to cut their tongue out, but people get their hands and legs and charts cut out in battle. In too, war, so. you're probably going to lose some parts, if not all of them. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. Especially with with when you're poor like that, you don't have armor and whatever. You're just recruited with very little. Uh, so of, maybe yeah. you could argue that these spy efforts that sacrifice, I don't know, a few score kids stop a war that might sacrifice a few thousands of kids. Yeah. I guess maybe you can just, I don't know. I don't know. I feel like I'm reaching and trying to defend this. Yeah, but it's, I mean, it's worth trying to make that a case. But at the end of it, yeah, I feel the same way. I'm like, yeah, you make the case, but you don't feel good about it after. It's like, yeah, I don't know yeah. if I agree with yeah. my, my own <laughs> argument here. But I yeah. guess. For me, it makes me lean on the idea of Varys having some sort of, in his eyes, ultimately noble goal. I, I, like, 
I don't see what he gets out of this to justify what he's choosing to do. You know what I mean? Like, it mm. doesn't make sense to me. Like, he's found such success and security and et cetera. Why keep doing this unless that he has some large overarching uh, yeah. goal that, like, is, in his eyes, noble and for the best of the realm, you know? He would have to go to a place like Westeros to have that impact because Essos is not a united place where, like, getting to rising to the top at Pentos only gives you power in Pentos, whereas rising to the top at the Red Keep gives you power over all of Westeros. So it's a place where and he can actually... And a power over Pentos also. True. It's a place where he can, places, yeah. he can have a bigger effect because he can affect the whole country rather than one city. So that might help us understand why he went to... Why he decided to go to West... Why he took the job. Like, which is a big question. Why did he take the job from Ares? Why did he give up all this wealth, this position of power? Why is he starting from scratch? Again, we talked about how moving from here to Pentos would be starting from scratch. He's got to start... All his criminal activities have to be restarted from the beginning... He's a little better at it this third time around, I'm sure. And this time he's got the crown's gold to help with a huge head start. But still, why? <laughs> well, the, the why question is still there, but it is worth pointing out. He might not be starting quite as much from scratch because I suppose that he plotted this for a while. You he might, already yeah. got contacts set up in Westeros, mm -hmm. the Red Keep or whatever. He has his own wealth that he accumulated there. He gets to bring with him in addition to the crown's gold. So now it's still probably at first was a step down. But it does set him up to have a bigger impact, like we're saying. And so if he has some goal of like making the world better through a better leader or, you know, whatever else, maybe even something crazy like he also knows about the prophecy or is mm. worried about the White Walkers. That, that, that seems like a stretch, too, since he's never said anything about it. And it seems like he should or could have been angling more toward to support the wall if that was the case. But I, so one way or the other, the... What is the, the the path to evil is paved with good intentions. Yeah. You know, like mm -hmm. maybe path he does yeah. have some sort of altruistic goals, but mm -hmm. he's lost sight of it, I feel like. I agree. My, well, I guess, uh, you can go on, actually. Okay. Like, you can think about it for a sec. Uh, I have one other quick thing to say. Yeah, so if you look at uh, it, if you want to have his humanitarian goals in mind. I know, I know possible, what I was going to say. Okay, go for it. Was that... The other thing here is that think about how much Varys has to put on, like, a, a certain persona all the time in Westeros. He's mm -hmm. not just, like, as you said, like, it's a slight step down for the chance of a step up, though. It's like he might have had some amount of pleasures, enjoyment, freedom, like, other things in his life when he lived in Pentos. He could not put on a persona all the time uh, but he is committing when he goes to westeros like he is doing this all full-time mummery all the day yeah, yeah. All like the is time. he really this effeminate is he really this you know is, he, is that his real speaking voice like none of these things we can't trust any of it like he's could all of it could be putting on airs yeah 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 i'm like he had to he sacri i guess my point is he sacrificed a certain amount of his comfort and freedom actually for which is this, a that big he deal never make up. why again it's like yeah. what is his and, ambition here he certainly gave up a lot for it that's that's important and, and comfort, freedom, and maybe even identity and morality. Mm, yeah. Also. yeah. Yes. And comfort. Yeah. He gave up a lot. He gave. He maybe looks like he took more risks. Yeah. It's just. It's a big question. Yeah. Why did he do it? What What brought him to Westeros? So if we're going back to his criminal organization stuff, if you argue that he has humanitarian goals now, which I'm open to, even though it's questionable, he definitely didn't seem to have that when he was just a master thief, or prince of thieves, or selling secrets and stealing from the wealthy that it's already hard to argue that was humanitarian even if he wasn't like a guy who's like addicted to wealth or his mo primary motivation isn't necessarily money maybe it's being recognized or not being seen as a nobody if we go back to the story about the sorcerer and how he's just like yeah you're you're nobody just die you know but uh Normally, when you peg someone as a master criminal slash mafioso, you, you pin it on personal ambition, not like, oh, I'm a mafioso because I want to change the world. On the other hand, you do occasionally see, like, mafia bosses have a surprising sympathy for their people who are not criminals. Like, they, like they really want to take care of certain families or cities or places that are not evil or not bad. They just have a fondness for that, and they do good for that aspect of their life while still doing all sorts of other evil things it's even even that gets a little gray um so if we're trying to give examples of like evil people doing good things there's plenty of examples you know um so far as maybe that's the bucket to put him in even though it's still not a one-to-one -one relationship it's, mm, it's you know you can kind of feel the difference there i guess 
And the point isn't to think about how these little birds, little mice were abused and manipulated. It definitely matters, of course. But it's to remind ourselves of what we're dealing with. This is what Varus is capable of. This is what this man is capable of. He's willing to just put on this persona, like we said, adopt a personality and, and act, be a mummer for 20 years for whatever goal he has in mind. And so he's he's suffering for his goal as, as well, whatever it is, in I addition to forcing these children to suffer and do these things and all that. I mean, think of how dead-eyed they look when Kevin is faced with the kids with the daggers just surrounding him, coming to stab mm -hmm. him to death. Yeah. They don't, they come off like a little inhuman, the way Kevin sees them. Like, they don't seem, like, the way they're looking at him and everything. It doesn't, it's ominous and I'd dark. I'd say that commitment is probably one of the ways that I, I felt that there was some sort of parallel connection with Melisandre mm. between them is that, I, we seem to have seen that she is fully committed and would sacrifice even her life, if, if that's true, you know, for yeah. her cause. And I think that, that this is Vari sacrificing his life, his entire, like you said, 20 years of him living this particular life in the pursuit of this. Mm. I don't know. Maybe there's an argument for he does enjoy an element of it. He loves being a mummer. He loves tricking people and, and seeing people be puzzled by, like, maybe, maybe I... And being too extreme when I say that he was, like, sacrificing him, his life for 20 years to this cause, maybe he actually enjoyed lots of this. Hmm. He might yeah. have loved it. It's possible. He might like taking advantage of people, manipulating yeah, them, and he getting might. them to do his bidding through his He might be like, ha, ha, silly Westerosi suckers. nobles. They're so dumb. <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> and how did this get started? I guess just because he – it was what was done to him. He had awful things done to him, like the child slave forced to do stuff. He's, like, trained a certain way. He's like, yep. I'm going to do that to others. It's a parallel to, uh, it's a common, rather, maybe not parallel, it's a common theme throughout A Song of Ice and Fire. What we do is what was done to us. You know, uh, pay it forward. Uh, we dance on the strings of those who came before us. It's, it's pointed out a number of different ways, but it's kind of the same concept. We are, to some extent, the product of our environment. And what was done to us is often what we do to others. You know, we, we inflict our trauma on, on other people. That's very common. And it's uh, kind of ironic, too, because Varus's spy operation really relies on this. This is the heart of what makes him so good at fit ferreting out secrets. And why people are like, how does he get these secrets? It must be sorcery. Which, as we say, might be very ironic, given his possible hatred of sorcery. But it's like, it's one of those answer before the question things that we, we've had a number of times to point out. A number of cases to point out. A number of occasions to point out. Like, cat brings up the idea that virus might be a sorcerer a full book before this origin story that he tells Tyrion about hating sorcery so you might go a whole book thinking it's actually possible and you later later you find out it's not sorcery probably it's something way more awful sorcery arguably isn't even awful although the type of sorcery done to him that he was described certainly is <laughs> but you find that out later you're like oh so it's little birds and that's why he's so good at ferreting out secrets. It's something that Ned and Kat can't conceptualize. They're like, he does what now? They aren't, they, they're not even close to figuring out the truth. They know he has informants, they know he has spies, but they don't realize he's training child slaves and cutting their tongues out. That, that's completely in the dark. They're completely in the dark about that. Uh, which they might, that's so they, another reason, go ahead. That's another reason to call them little birds, both in general and versus mice, because you can imagine someone mistreating mice. But it's hard to imagine someone mistreating birds. Does that make mm. sense? It just sounds so nicer, even when Caitlin yeah. or you know someone more on on the outskirts or even kind of close in hears about Varys's little birds, like, oh, how sweet! You're giving the kids little chores, you know? Like, <laughs> it still doesn't seem so sinister as the reality that you find out. Yeah. And I'm guessing he's careful not to let many people find that reality out, right? Yep, you're right about that. So, what is it, it ultimately? What brought him to Westeros is a question we cannot answer, but it is a question worth posing. Why did he take this job? What was his angle? What did he see as his endgame? Is it, is it, this is an opportunity to impact a large population and do good? Or is it just moving up the ladder, the criminal ladder? They keep moving up higher. They're, they, first they stole gems and valuables. Then they stole secrets. Then they just copied secrets. Then and that just kept going up the ladder. Is this just higher up on the ladder, manipulating an entire country, doing their their game, their which which is stealing something and then selling it back? They have stolen peace and prosperity from Westeros. 
and are trying to sell it back in the form of Aegon, a champion who will bring peace and prosperity. But they're a big part of the reason that the realm is in chaos in the first place. So it's that same game that they've been doing for decades. Steal something, sell it back. <laughs> they're just in this case, it's peace and prosperity. Even if they and they're like, yeah, but we're we're gonna give them peace and prosperity. We're not bad guys. I don't know. Even if you fully believe what Ke he says to Kevin when Kevin lays dying, there's got to be more to it, though. Even if that's his goal, there's still more to it. It's a, it was a huge reveal, but it was not a complete reveal. Oh, another thought, too, Sean. Backing up just a little bit. Y'all were saying how this, this virus and his, his little birds are, are parallel to some things. One other parallel is to the others. Because um, a recurring theme of the whole series is, is power, authority, slavery, control. The others are controlling the dead. They, and some of whom may have memories. Whether you have slavery in Slaver's Bay or this and that. This is another form of that. This is enslavement with darkness. It's the reason those kids look evil and, and dark is because George wanted to show that this is evil. I mean, it doesn't, you don't need to, to do much to show that it's evil <laughs> to do this with children. But he made very sure to emphasize that. And remember what's happening in this scene. It's cold. Icy wind is blowing through the window. He, he wants to mm. close it. But then he re virus opened the window because Pycelle shat himself when he died. <laughs> he just wanted to stink <laughs> to be out. So it's kind of a very mundane reason for the window to be open. But it's still case of that effect. Kevin sees the white raven before, right before he's shot. So we're absolutely thinking of the others. He's looking, mm. oh, look, winter, right raven. Bam, shot. And then Varys really is an ice spider <laughs> as big as a hound. <laughs> yeah, instead of <laughs> eight legs, implant. instead of eight legs, the children are like his other legs. It's it's more yeah. symbolic than literal. Yeah. So it's amazing how Varys is so unique, so different, so mysterious. Yet he still fits so many of the themes of the book. Some of the central themes of power, control, ambition, making a mark on the world, love versus duty. Which we're not quite sure how that fits in with him, but if it might be family love or duty that he's working on. That's It's entirely possible that fits here. We're just not sure. So it's one of the reasons Virus is really special. George knows he's got a special character. I think Var George is aware that he he's created something unique with this character. And I'm looking forward to more. I'm looking forward to what else we learn about him. I, I want to say one quick thing, because I don't... You made a million awesome points, and I don't want to take away from the idea that he's this theme of, like, taking something to sell it back but Ares and robert did plenty to put the realm in turmoil it oh yeah really just playing var oh yeah for, uh, it's <laughs> not just it. him he, once it starts to happen he might feed those flames to put himself in a better position afterwards it may be a parallel to little finger in certain ways too kind of came from nothing and uses the the disorder and secrets to move himself up you know yet another parallel i think it's interesting but but still just regular people. It doesn't take manipulative monsters to screw the world up. Yeah. Right. They, yeah. <laughs> well, I know. And Robert forget. is just a, a doofus, a, a, an arrogant, manipulative, or what's the word manipulative? Uh, arrogant. Misogynist. Just, you yeah. Know, just uh, kind doofus, of, you know, and he's doing lazy. a fine job <laughs> yeah. without any kind of menacing background or yeah. secret plan or whatever. So well, let's also uh, not forget that, um, Oh, I have no idea what I was going to say. Spaced out. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Let's also not forget. Yeah, that was, also not that forget. Was well, too sentiment. bad. I already yeah. did. Yes. <laughs> um, so, yeah, maybe I'll remember that later. Question from Wheezy Squeezebox. If the little birds can read and write, what's the point of cutting out their tongues? Ah, they are... This is another reason why it's so devious and so insidious is they don't read and write in the way the same way. He taught them a cipher. He taught them a different language. Like, they don't communicate the way normal people can. Well, they can still read. They just said that they haven't figured out how to translate that. Like, they can read it but not write it. Yeah, they, no, they can read. Yeah, they can maybe copy what they were, they've seen. But they're, they're, oh. they're trained to, to write it down or memorize it, like, visually and not necessarily knowing what it means. Okay. Is kind of how I read it. Like, they, okay. they learned a cipher. Like, he's taught them their, a, a secret language that he invented. That uh, probably keeps so, them. Okay, so maybe you're keeps saying them from they, communicating. They probably don't actually like. What I'm getting getting from that is that maybe they don't actually read the words. They are able to like 
like recognize, the, recognize symbols. the symbols, but they're not reading like, oh, the shipment is going out. They don't know what it means tomorrow. necessarily. They're just seeing like the shipment, like those words, and they communicate it. Mm-hmm. So, like, I, like, I they could write really the symbols read. of Egyptian hieroglyphics or you don't know Russian it, yeah. alphabet, you but know. I don't know what they mean when I write it out, yeah. but I can still do that. Yeah. Too. And you might have a cipher to where you can make every, you know, every time you see an S, you make, you draw a certain kind of scratch, right? And like, they have that. For, so they can just copy it down in a cipher. I get, yeah, which makes it even worse that he, they, they're not, he's not actually contributing to the literacy of Westeros at all, like I thought. <laughs> well, it's also possible they can read or write like normal, but it wouldn't be expected, and it's a lot harder to slip up. It's easy to accidentally say something out loud or be overheard, but it's it's hard to accidentally... And they're children. They're not going to be maybe as careful as they would be, but also he just doesn't keep them doesn't employ them once they cease to be children. So they're much more manipulable and yeah, but he doesn't want to take chances because their tongues out. There's no, there's no risk. There's a risk later down the line. Yeah, it's bad. Like, I, I think that the, the, we have servants in Delirio's mansion that refuse to speak to Tyrion. I wonder if those are retired little birds. They can't speak to Tyrion. Yeah. Mm. They have exactly. no tongues. It's entirely possible. Mm-hmm. It's also possible he doesn't cut out everyone's tongue, just certain people for certain roles or certain yeah, ages, I guess. you know, that, Especially, I, I don't. Uh, I kind of doubt that because if he's worried about security, then why why take that risk? Well, because he might be worried about things other than security, like spreading false information. He might want people to, to say things out loud that are untrue. Well, I don't think he would use children for that. But you, yeah, you he, might he, be has right. other, yeah. he has other agents that are not little birds. Yeah, his okay. little yeah, birds yeah. always yeah. lose their tongues. But yeah, he does have other yeah, agents that that. Yeah. that can speak with other tasks and yeah, other yeah, yeah that's what you're getting at and i do think that's true he can't only have one type of a level of info i mean we see yeah. like yeah he, he has people that work for him that speak and it's interesting to compare as we said at the beginning i kind of introduced it this way like Littlefinger has parallels to virus obviously but it's he's he's in the conversation but I, as we've shown throughout this episode is aria danny and even ned have more be more compelling parallels to virus even if they're less like him overall as a whole they have these strong things in common one of the reasons he wanted young Aegon, young griff to suffer and learn fear is, to, is so he can know what that's like instead of being born with everything right so he doesn't want him to have a privileged upbringing he himself had the value of coming up from nothing and wants Aegon to have seen all levels of society like that in that sense i kind of like yeah, that's not the worst thing that's kind of I can see that i kind of vibe with that he wanted that you know we wanted him to see things from all levels. It's, it's, it does seem to be a better idea than just having someone completely only exposed to privilege. Like it's that's also that's another way of life that one should experience to have a, a comprehensive view on it. Poor and rich. Like if you want to be a good ruler, you know, you want to have an idea of what all those things are like. He thinks that kind of upbringing is important for a ruler. I don't entirely disagree. I ex- I agree with a lot of it, but you can't just manufacture it. You know, <laughs> especially in the face of someone who has genuinely lived that life for real, like he probably did, or Danny has. Danny actually has been chased. The life that she, he's trying to manufacture for Aegon is one that Danny has really had, and it's one of the biggest ironies. If we return to Blood Raven as a parallel again, if Virus is trying to save Westeros or make it a better world, he's been toying with the life of the person who's actually best equipped to do that, which is Danny. He, he's used her as a, as a pawn. Oh, yeah, this is what I was going to say before, Sean. One of Varys and Lyra's biggest plans to destabilize the realm didn't happen. Remember, they were going to try... They were kind of con Khal Drogo into invading. That was their plan. If that had worked, they'd absolutely be heavily responsible for destroying the peace and prosperity yeah. of Westeros. It just didn't... It just didn't work. <laughs> you know? It's, it might, but it'll be Danny leading them and not, you know, Viserys or some weirdo. Someone it who's seems incredible. a bit of an ambitious plan. Even for Danny, I'm suspicious of that coming yeah. to fruition. But. Or going well or whatever. Yeah, it's just... Yeah. Yeah. Still, so the changing slash evolution of Virus and Lyra's plans definitely outside of the scope of this episode, but, you know, it's a good way to kind of leave things here as we're working our way to the end. So not only would several characters never accept Virus' treatment of children, again, Danny and Arya, they're not parallels to him, but they are problems <laughs> if he's found out. And he's also missing the bigger picture, as we've said. He's concerned with saving Westeros from humanity or from itself, but it's this inhuman element that threatens Westeros even more, meaning the others, meaning the Long Night. It's something I very much look forward to, like him realizing, oh, God, there's a bigger problem. Will he? Will that ever even happen? Maybe he'll die before that fully comes into play. I don't think so, though. I think having his reaction to that, all his grand plans, so well executed, so 
so much discipline over so long to make this work. Just supernatural winter appears and overtakes all that. The most well-informed man, the most devious man, but he hasn't seen this coming. Well, as you said, Sean, I don't think he has any idea about this. His, he has a vast spy network, but there's none of those spies are beyond the wall. Why would he bother with that? Like, what does he care about that? <laughs> For, to, from his perspective, it's what does he need to know that's happening up there? What, what, what value would that have to him? You know? Well, apparently some, but not from where he's sitting. I wouldn't think it. So if Varus truly hates those who practice the supernatural, that's another problem for him too. The others? <laughs> I don't know. Those aren't people. I mean, it's a problem one way or the other. <laughs> uh, the Red Priests. I don't know how that's going to go. I don't think he's going to be too happy with that. Um, several other associated elements. Those, the story's getting more magical, Varus. Sorry about that. <laughs> the higher magic elements are coming out. I don't know if that's going to work for you, but... It doesn't exactly help us predict his reaction, but we, we get a sense that he's not going to be too pleased about his whole grand plan maybe crumbling in the face of overwhelming supernatural elements and, and dragons <laughs> from both ends. Like, you got the, the winner and the dragons. These are Neither of these are working for me right now. But we'll see. We shall see. I, I think that another angle you could take is that if he, on some level, has been affected by how he was abused as a child, mm -hmm. and so wants to change the world for that to not happen, yet he's abusing children. He hates magic because of how it was used against him as a child. Well, maybe he'll start to use magic. You know, maybe, you know, he, yeah. in many ways, he's a means justifies the ends, I think. And I think magic will fall under that umbrella too, assuming he's even genuine about not liking magic in the first place. Right, which is entirely, he might not give a crap. He might be like, no, it doesn't matter to me at all. Like, yeah. It works, it works. Yeah, like, yeah I do it too. <laughs> Yeah, and that's such a great oncoming thing. Like, Danny and Virus have not met in in, in the, the books yet. Obviously, we saw what happened on the show. It doesn't really give us a whole lot of clue what I think is going to happen in the books. Uh, Illyrio, also, there's going to be things that happen with him. We'll have cause to discuss a lot more of these things uh, from later in Virus's life. We'll be coming back to some of these subtopics in different ways. Of course, it never ends. There's always fun stuff to talk about. Virus is just one of the deeper wells we can uh, dip our cup into <laughs> one that we certainly couldn't do in one episode probably not even two depending on how you look at it the trivia answer for today the question was again which character in song of ice and fire is paralleled in dune on this episode it's Illyrio mopatis and baron harkonnen he has rings on all his fingers with gems he is unusually light on his feet in the books he's he doesn't float He's light on his feet because he's using suspensors. They don't flow to have him in float entirely. They just have him walk lighter. Illyrio is unusually light on his feet also. As Tyrion notices, he's like, wow, he's, he's, he's really big, but he's light on his feet. Uh, and, of course, there's a ton of parallels between what Illyrio and Varys do and Baron Harkonnen's plan for his children and inflicting them as rulers and people going out into the desert. And this is why you should check out our Dune episode with Alt Shift X. This stuff is all in there. And I think you'd enjoy it if you are at all a Dune fan. Even if you've only seen the movies, I think you'd still like it. You'd be surprised at how many parallels there are between the two stories. Yes, indeed. I'm not going to tell you what episode is next week. We're going to have that one be a surprise again, but I will give you a few suggestions on other episodes to listen to that relate to this one. Um, Valar Reredus is a good place to start because Varus just pops in and out all over the place. But our Blackfire series has some um, Varus stuff in it because of this. A bit more about Illyrio as well, of course. Uh, of course, the education episode is very relevant because it's the same format as this one. The young Ned, very different person from Varys, but of course an important character whose upbringing was huge in forming the person he became, just like it is for Varus, even if those particular formative elements were very different. And, of course, it depends on how you see Varus, what his plans are, as to see maybe some of the other connective episodes, like Valyrian stuff, or not. <laughs> but I think that'll get you started. And... Yeah, that's our show for today, folks. We'll be back next week, and we'll be delving deeper into a variety of other topics. It should be a great 2024. We're in March now, and we're going to have a TV show this year and plenty more book content. One quick note, the Oscars are 
later tonight, depending on when you're watching this video. And uh, each year I make a one minute review of all the best picture nominees. So I'll have that in, out in the next couple of days too. Nice. Yeah. Sean's quick Oscar reviews are very nice. Very, very good. useful. You, you are very knowledgeable about movies. Yeah. I, I like the style. I like the format a lot. Yeah. And me too so thanks everybody for coming in today if you watched live we appreciate your presence in the chat a lot of great questions today it seemed like the chat was particularly bustling on this particular sunday and if you're catching it later feel free to shen, shen, send questions to us in many of the different ways you are able to and uh, thanks to nina for helping me talk through a lot of aspects of virus's life here it's really good to have someone that can float these ideas off someone who knows the series extremely well yeah, someone knows knows the details extremely well and has a lot of insight that was very helpful here because this is such a tough topic. It's very fun, but very but very difficult. A lot, a lot harder than some of the world building topics, but also more rewarding in some ways. Oh, we, also we also just got a super chat from April May. Oh, thanks, April uh, who May. Said, thanks you, thank you all. Great fun. Thanks, April. I loved all your commentary this episode. It was it was nice. Yeah, that catch about the eyes was cool. Well, yeah, I definitely yeah. missed that on my own. So yeah, good job. absolutely. Happy to have you with us. Yeah, and thanks as well to Joey, Jesse, and Bran for the various assistance with music and video. And we'll be seeing a new House of the Dragon intro from Bran later in the year. And Michael Clarfeld, of course, always got to shout him out. He is. A great friend of ours and has helped our show look a lot more professional with his maps that you see behind me and the video intro uh, that we have for our regular episodes. Yeah, you can go to claradox.de if you want to look at all of his maps, print them yourselves, order them from him, whatever you prefer. It's really affordable to just get the file and go print it, though. I highly recommend yeah, it. Yeah, K-L-A-R-A-D-O-X dot D-E is his website. Yeah, you can buy the files from him and then and have, has... take them to your local print shop and have them printed a way that fits your wall your, size yeah. or your frame that you already have yeah and he has lord of the rings witcher what dungeons yeah, and dragons it's not just game of thrones stuff yeah, yeah it's not just a song of ice and fire at all i um, mean it's a variety of types of a song of ice and fire ones he's got like one with a targaryen family tree on it i can't say enough positive things about michael me neither but we'll keep saying them anyway even though we'll mm. never run out <laughs> that's it for our show today, everyone, and you know what to do in between now and the next one. And always, Valar Re Redis.